Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. NWA World Championship Wrestling, December 5th, 1987. It was a very different show in that it was not from the studios. No, entire show from the Miami Beach Convention Center. Yes. Opened in progress with Larry Zabisco against Barry Windham. A fine example of how to do absolutely nothing and still have a good TV match. Dude, you don't even know, Vinny. They started this match 10 minutes in. Mm Mm-hmm. So... I mean, it was a Larry Zbysko match, so we missed nothing. Yeah. But I'm sure there was a lot of nothing happened in the first 10 minutes of this match. Yeah. No, you're right. The, the, there was head scissors. I did like uh, Barry Windham escaping head scissors by hitting knees to the knee. Yeah. I'm not making that up. And finally, he got thrown outside, and they killed like a good three or four minutes just with Larry making Windham fight to get back into the ring. He get up the apron, and Larry hit him, and Barry fall down. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So, at last, he got back in the ring. Did we mention that Bill Alfonso was the referee? Yeah, Bill Alfonso was the referee. I presume, by the way, that this was not live. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't. But they pretended like it was live. Yes. And so, I guess we were supposed to think that they told Barry and Larry to go to the ring 10 minutes before the show started. Yeah. We'll pick up. <laughs> I have... We're going to presume you guys are going to go 10 minutes. Yeah, as Larry Zabisco, there will not be a flash pin in the first two minutes. Nah, it's no. unlikely. But yeah. So as the time's counting down... It so seemed it seemed fudging, by the way. It seemed like Tony was fudging the time. I was not checking his accuracy. I wasn't either. Who, I thought about Who am it. I to doubt the uh, accuracy in the... Uh, well, once I started timing the Royal Rumble entrances, now I don't believe anything. Got it. Because those are full of shit. Yes. But he goes, five minutes left. And then very shortly after, he said, three minutes left. Yeah. There was a four minutes in there, too. Yeah. So it was funny, as he's counting down, Wyndham keeps trying to win with the submission holds. Goes with an abdominal stretch. He goes for a sleeper. Then I thought, well, he is the champion. Logically, it makes sense for him to try to kill the clock at this point. Or try to get a submission. I guess. Because we're not supposed to think that's, that's a rest hold. I guess. That's a finishing maneuver. He's trying to make the man give up yeah. before the time limit expires. Well, he failed. And he had a sleeper on uh, Zabisco, and the time expired. And you, the viewer at home, were left thinking, man, he probably would have won with just one more minute. Zabisco was done for. I did like that. It's Jim Ross and Tony doing commentary. Tony's like a baby face announcer. They're both baby faces. There really wasn't a heel announcer no. in WWE at this point. No. But uh, Tony, with 15 seconds left, he's counting down the time. I'm a little skeptical just because it seems quick. Mm-hmm. Then he goes, we got 15 seconds left. 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, th- oh, time's up. Well, maybe he fell behind and was trying to catch up. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Or it may not. I mean, I can count, you know. It may not have been on the up and up. Maybe his heart was beating so fast at each beat. You know, like a yeah. human heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah, once okay. a second. Got more excited. If you're not in bad shape or anything like that. So it's a time limit draw. Baby doll hits the ring, ter- tears Barry, uh, grabs him by the hair and yanks him off of Zabisco. So Barry is mad and is stalking her around the ring, but Larry hits him with a knee to the back and went An illegal knee to the spinal cord, I wrote down here. True. I don't know if that's exactly what happened. Technically, the match was over, so anything would be illegal. Yeah, you could kill a man with that move. He just he just threw his knee right in the man's spinal column. Mm-hmm. Window survived, and they were still shouting at each other as they went to the back. Sting joined the announcers for a promo. May I for a moment here? Sure. I can tell you one thing. I've been doing this a long, a long time. 1995. Some of you listening to this weren't even born when I started writing about wrestling. I've I've had a lot of analogies in my life, made a lot of comparisons. I can tell you that before today, I never, ever thought that I could compare Sting to Mojo Rawley. Nah. Am I wrong? There, there, there's something to be said there. He was fucking Mojo Rawley here. He was completely out of his mind. He was too hyped. He was too hyped. That is exactly true. He <laughs> was too hyped. He had no idea what he was going to say from one word to the next. And sometimes he would find something to make sense. And sometimes he would just change the subject. And sometimes he would just get lost and go, ah! 
Wow. Often he would just scream. Just scream randomly. Was very excited he has a scorpion on his pants now. Oh, yeah. Very excited about that. It's just like me, he said. <laughs> Something like that. I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. All I know is, I swear to God, during this promo, a cop showed up. I thought he was going after Sting. <laughs> Instead, he was making sure a fan didn't get his hands on him. Yes. This guy was out of his fucking mind. I like when he said, Ric Flair, you got that figure four leg lock, and I bet that figure four. And then he realized he had to finish this thought somehow, and he just says, It feels ah! good! <laughs> it feels good compared to my scorpion. Yeah. All I know... <laughs> I mean, he was awesome. It was great. The fans absolutely loved this <laughs> it was, guy. It was so much more fun than 20 minutes of monotone delivery. Oh, yeah. But man, crazy young Sting promos are a workout for everyone. Oh, yeah. The viewer, Sting, the fans. Tony has to hold the mic and he's moving all over the place. You know what I <sighs> love? I never watch these goofy WWE, these extra things they put on the network. Mm -hmm. Like, I got enough to watch. But if they ever did a table for three... And it was like Sting and Ric Flair and, I don't know, J.J. Dillon. Mm -hmm. Just a third guy. And they just hijacked it. Like, they, they hijacked the show or they, they, what would be the word? They dominated? They, no, like Sting isn't expecting it. I see. So they ambush him. Ambush him. Mm -hmm. And it's 30 minutes of just playing early Sting promos and getting a reaction from the Sting the 57 year old sting of yes. 2018 that'd be the best fucking show in net network it would be ever in the history of the network god yeah. he was crazy warlord and barbarian teaming up for the first time here on tv versus jack towers and robbie idol yeah became a one man geek team as uh, we were told ivan koloff pulled uh, i believe it was towers yanked him to the floor and beat him up so was Robbie Idol left in the ring? Yes, it was Idol left in the ring. Yeah, I don't know why I cared, but like I looked up Jack Towers and Robbie Idol, mm -hmm. and Jack Towers, I guess, was a longtime fan. Didn't have a long career, unsurprisingly, if you watch this match, and then went into stunt work. And this Robbie Idol guy, unless there's a different Robbie Idol, he was still doing any shows a couple of weeks ago. Wow. Yeah. Well, I hope he's improved. Hey, a couple of years ago, I apologize. I hope he's improved because the... He was horrible here. The Robbie Idol we saw in this match was the worst wrestler of all time of the week. He is very bad. He didn't know how to take a backbreaker from the Barbarian, who... It's the Barbarian. If you just stand there, he'll backbreaker you and you'll be fine. But Robbie Idol found a way to fuck this up, and I didn't think that was possible. They beat him up, and they won with a demolition-style diving headbutt. Yeah, it was Demolition's finish with the diving headbutt from the Barbarian. The Barbarian was the only guy in this match that was even passable. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So then Paul Jones and Barbarian and Warlord and Ivan Koloff joined David Crockett for a promo. Actually, actually I take it back. Shivani says David Crockett will be interviewing Paul Jones. And they fade to black, and I'm all excited to get David Crockett and Paul Jones in one shot. And it comes back, and it's not David Crockett. It's Tony. So... Jones explains he has the two strongest wrestlers in the world. No, he says he has the two world's strongest wrestlers. That's exactly what he said. Repeatedly he says this. The I don't think that's a proper sentence. That would be the strongest wrestlers of two worlds. <laughs> the two world's strongest wrestlers. Yes. The warlord. World's, world's strongest should be singular. It should be the world's two strongest wrestlers would be yeah the two correct. strongest wrestlers in the world that would also work yeah, yeah. not the world's two not no not the two world's strongest wrestlers strongest wrestlers right uh it's just that hard he also called them the warlord and the ball baron yeah and he i think he said that he thought it would take him a year to put these two men together but thankfully he had ivan koloff the ring general to make it happen earlier I don't know. All I know is he vowed to say, he, he said, we will see big things in 1988. They used to always mention the year. They did. Remember that? It was like, in 1986, blah, 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 blah. Oli was the best at it. Yeah. We need more of that here in 2018. 2018 is the year I get rid of you. Yeah. And I even said they were indestructible. It's proved to be, uh, not be true. Then we had an absolutely baffling segment where Ron Garvin came out and cut the exact same sad sack promo yeah. that he cut on TV last week. Like, word for word. 
Same thing about what happens when a uh, football team loses the Super Bowl. They fire the players and the coach. I can't fire the player or the coach. I'm the only guy. So I got to tr- double my training. I swim 10 miles instead of 5. I run 20 miles instead of 10. It was weird. I was like, did, did, you, did no one here realize that he cut a promo last week and it was the same? Did they also all forget? I mean, they were in studio last week, right? This yeah. wasn't just, they didn't just replay this. No, this they, were, they were in studio last week and oh, at the damn. building here. It was so weird. Now, he did, at the end, he added more, specifically specifically about the bunkhouse stampede, where he would face many tough men, including Big Wilbur. Big Wilbur. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He couldn't wait to prove that he could whip 25 guys. Steve Williams versus Jerry Gray. i got to say this about Steve Williams. His technical wrestling was not the best, but you know what he was? He was a big powerful, explosive guy. Well, that's true. That could convince you, and he didn't need to do a lot of convincing. No. That he was a badass. Oh, yeah. And he would fuck you up. This, <laughs> this, this, it, that that should be the idea behind pro wrestling. Right? I was watching this, and he was so scary, I regretted that I ever got into wrestling for fear that I may have had a match with him at some point. Yeah. God, remember on the Retro Raw we just watched where he almost killed Ed Ferrara? Ed Ferrara? <laughs> yes. Jesus Christ. So, Like, isn't that the whole thing? Like, it's fake, but we want to believe that the guys are at least badasses. Yes. You should always believe that guy would beat me up. Yeah. That should be... I always think that. So, he's in there with Jerry Gray. Now, Who Gray was... you could beat up, <laughs> but he was a jobber. So. Actually, Jerry Gray... Yeah. <laughs> I might have had a lot of comments, Jerry Gray, actually. He he was big. He had way more charisma than most of the jobbers they had. I mean, he was not as big as Steve Williams, but he was a big guy. He had, like I say, way more charisma than your average Jim Crockett promotions jobber. He was fucking up everything. Now, the oh, good yeah. news is he was in there, in there with Dr. Death, so it didn't matter. Gray would fuck something up, and Doc would say, it's cool, I got this. And he just, he'd overcome it through sheer brute force. He's at the wrong angle for a schoolboy. I will just roll you back over anyway. Great missed times going up for a jump. Don't worry. I'll just press you over my head four or five times. I got it. And this goes on, and Doc wins with the Oklahoma Stampede. <laughs> and then he got a promo, and it was a little like Sting's in that he just goes from point to point to point and isn't always sure where he's going. He didn't howl, though. He did not howl. No. He didn't have a scorpion on his pants. But he did uh, talk about how great his win over Barry Windham was. Said he proved he was the wrestling machine of the year of the world. Yeah. <laughs> he talked about the bunkhouse stampede. Warned the fans, don't miss it. He mentioned by name Lex Luger, Dusty Rhodes, and the Rock and Roll Express. And said in the stampede, they wouldn't be friends anymore. Oh, man. So I got to talk about this next guy here. This Bob Cook that wrestled Sting. Bob Cook ruled. Well, let me tell you something, Vinny. So... I don't remember all the details. If you want to go back through very, very old figure fours, I'm sure you can find it. But in like the very first year I ever did the newsletter, I interviewed, I don't even remember who, but he was a jobber. All right. And I, the headline was something like interview with a jobber or something. Okay. <laughs> was Tom Cruise in it? I don't know. But anyway, the point of this was. <laughs> interview with a <the> jobber. <laughs> so, that would be a good movie, by the way. It would, actually. God damn. So I interviewed this guy, and I got a little bit of feedback. That's people were upset that I'd used the word jobber. Aha. You see, it's a derogatory term, they said. These men job, these jobbers are to be respected. Sure. These jobbers go in there, and they're, they're being paid to make these stars look like stars. You should respect the jobbers. Mm-hmm. I felt bad at the time. Yeah. Okay, listen to me, everybody. 80% of these fucking jobbers, okay... Are in fact. They fucking are terrible. Yes. They are not making the wrestlers look better. They're horrible at their job. They should have been paying to get in there and have matches with these guys. Yeah. Now, there were exceptions. Bob Cook is one of them. Amen. There were I feel bad for the guys like Bob Cook that I use the term jobber. Yeah. It is derogatory to call Bob Cook a jobber <laughs> and treat him in a derogatory manner. He's fucking great. He went in there, and he made Sting look like a million dollars. Absolutely. But this idea that, you know, back in the day, all of these jobbers, they were great workers. They were in there making the superstars look great. And the jobbers were often better than the wrestlers they were in the ring with. 
fucking incorrect. Most there were some, <laughs> but most of them shouldn't even have been in the ring. And we watch them every single week, over and over again. I wanted to spell this myth forever. I felt guilty about this. Over, over 18 years ago, I don't feel guilty anymore. <laughs> wow. Alert Granny. I will. So, yes, Bob Cook was awesome. He was, by a wide margin, better than Sting in this match. No, not even close. <laughs> He's bumping his ass off for everything Sting does. Clearly calling the spots to uh, get, you know, to, so he can throw a foot, or to Sting threw a kick. Cook caught it. I mean, he slapped Sting in the face, which is a mistake, and Sting fires up and hits a big enziguri, and Cook takes, a, Cook takes this awesome bump out of the ring. Falling, falling ass first through the ropes to the floor it was great. So Sting's just this no-selling destroyer in this match. He hits a stinger splash and the scorpion, and he wins. Wrong man won here. Yeah. But it was it accomplished its mission. I owe Bob Cook some million. I, Bob Cook, if you're listening, you are the man. Yeah, he's great. David Crockett interviewed the Road Warriors. God, David Crockett. Like, I still love the guy, but I mean, he's just kissing their ass. <laughs> it's, he was not an unbiased No, interview. not even close. A lot of people say this, but I mean, we all know. I don't even remember what he said. I was just, I was. Well, it was, to a large sickening. degree, to a large degree, it was every Road Warrior promo ever about how big and scary and dangerous they are. But they made it very, very clear that when Paul Jones said he had the two world's strongest wrestlers under his control, they took that as a personal affront. Yes. How dare you think Warlord and How dare and you Baron, butcher the English language like that? How dare you think say that Warlord and Ball Baron are bigger and stronger than Hawk and Animal? And they were all very... Even Ellering. Even Ellering was upset that Jones could be so stupid as to insult the fans' intelligence by suggesting that the later known as the Powers of Pain were the stronger team. And the worst part of it all was the bunkhouse stampede's going to come up. We're going to get our hands... The Warlord and Bob Barbarian will prove we're stronger than them. So, like I say, it was every Road Warriors promo ever, but they had one specific mission and one point to get over, which is that they are insulted by Paul Jones and his men, and they're going to get revenge. Great. Stan Lane versus Kendall Wyndham. Kendall Wyndham looks like a teenager trying to play pro wrestler in his backyard. Pretty much. I'm disgusted by this physique. I have... Should not have been allowed on work. television. <laughs> Well, yeah, that too. I mean, it was a lot of problems. Of the, of the two, actually, I was more offended by his work. He, what I thought was so great about this match, I'll just talk about the match in a second. I have no it. idea what you're going to say here. Well, I mean, it's not awesome. It's just funny. Kendall ends up on the apron, or he ends up outside the ring. Cornette waffles him with his racket. And I write, Cornette waffled him with the racket to get the heat. Then, ding, ding, ding. It's a fucking <laughs> count out. Yeah. This was the biggest waste of time in my whole life. <laughs> utter bullshit. You're having this terrible match. Kendall's running wild on him, which is why you thought it would be the heat, the, the, the racket spot would be. Kendall fucks up the whip into the corner, run up the middle rope to a body press. It's, it's basic stuff, but he fucked it up, and he almost fell down. So Stan had to, like, turn around and play dead to, to give Kendall time to recover, and Kendall peed him back when Stan turned around. Kendall does, does the shoot dive. Stan's still not in position. Just wipes him out. Nearly killed him. And then, yes, Kendall got thrown outside. Cornet hit him with a racket. Kendall got counted out. Stan Lane won. Stan Lane gets one singles match a year. And he won by count out. Hey. Now, I assumed... That's a W, baby. I assumed, and maybe this will still happen, we'll see, but somehow, perhaps this will lead to Kendall and a partner challenging the Midnight Express. Maybe. I can only assume that's... I can only, I can only hope we don't see that I, match. Well, I, I'm, sorry, I'm not saying I want to see it. I'm just trying to imagine what was going through their head when they booked this. Sure, yeah. Why, why Stan Lane couldn't pin Kendall Wyndham? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this fucking Dusty Rhodes promo. First off, he's in a duster, and he's wearing a hat that he got from either Abe Lincoln or Bob Cratchit. He looked like a homeless cowboy. It's a fucking stovepipe hat. With a rope around it. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> he's but got... he won the bunkhouse stampede twice, so he's there posing with his trophies, which are a badge. <sighs> Like you'd get if you're a sheriff in the old west, right? Right, yeah. And some ugly boots. What's it? It's like a bronze boot, I guess. I presume money was involved as well. Yeah, I mean, he's he's these got trophies are just for show. The stovepipe hat and the sunglasses and the duster and chaps. Thank God over jeans, but still. So he cuts it. He's won this thing twice before. He says, 
He's got to be the Stampede champion for the third time. How can you do it when he's all old and beat up and in pain every day? Always got to check to make sure his eyes and his ears and his nose are in the same place, whatever the hell he said. Then he mooed like a cow. I'm going to say that again. Dusty Rhodes mooed like a cow. Yes. And said he would be the bull of the woods. Well, this was something. Well, that's his, uh, that's his saying. The bull of the woods. Yeah, but not so much with the mooing, usually. Well, he, does, he usually doesn't moo. <laughs> it's usually a, but every now and then you got to try something different, Vinny. Well, he did try it. It was different. It was different. David Crockett interviews Ric Flair and J.J. Dillon. So Flair's got a title defense against Michael Hayes later on the show. Yeah, can you imagine? His first, as he pointed out, first world championship title defense on national TV in nearly two years. So he talks about how great the horsemen were, how great their opponents are, how everyone wants to wrestle the horsemen for the fame and the money and the notoriety and the prestige. Oh, and he talked about his, he said that would be the title match in his first title defense in two years on TV. All I know is this is a very generic promo. Yeah. Because Ric Flair needs a an antagonist. He needs somebody who has made him mad or who he believes has wronged him that he can then cut a promo on and simultaneously put them over and bury them. That's a good Ric Flair promo. Mm-hmm. Here he's just like, he won the title, he's had it five times, he's not doing anything right now. But they didn't have much to say about Hayes. Nah, he had nothing to say about anybody. Yeah. Hayes, he should have something to say about Hayes after the main event tonight. I guess so. Because Hayes beat his ass the entire time. Yes. And almost had the match won. Now he should be able to cut a promo on this guy next week. We can only hope. Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard versus Nelson Royal and the Italian Stallion. Two fine jobbers. They, they are, I don't know if they're in Bob Cook's league, but certainly no, better than most. No, but they, they were in there to make these guys look better, which is not hard. It's Tully and Arn. Yeah. They did mention that Nelson Royal was the world junior champion and he's in there and he's way bigger than Tully yeah I guess Tully could have fought for the junior title but it was below him I guess he's a world tag team champion and world TV champion before that and the national champion before that so as you noted Nelson Royal and Italian Stallion were two fine jobbers I thought this actually may have been like a fun match but the horseman squashed them and won with a spine buster in two minutes yeah they weren't getting paid by the hour they were not getting paid by the hour and then Crockett goes to interview Tully Arn and JJ Really, Tully and Arn. And I'll be honest, I didn't even notice anything Tully said. But Arn! Tully cut this great promo about what it means when you hold the actual belt. Mm. Says, everybody can come on TV and they can rant and rave about how they're the baddest and they're the toughest. But until you are holding these belts, Mm -hmm. you aren't. Right. And we are the champions. So then Arn is turning to talk and he says, it's the NWA, it's like all sports. Their dream goal is parody. They want you to believe that on any given night, any given team can be any other team. That's what the NFL wants. That's what baseball wants. That's what basketball wants. Well, that's not going to happen here as long as we're around because we're that much better than everyone else. Then he adds, we've got no interest in going to Hollywood. We're just going to go to the ring and sacrifice and sweat and be the best at what we do. Oh, man. He's just he's starting a problem here. And that's going to make us. We're already stars, he says, everywhere we go. It was a subtle jab at a piece what he said last week. Yes, he's he's targeting Lex. He's not happy about Lex losing focus on wrestling. Nikita Koloff versus Mark Starr. You know what I love about this, by the way? Starcade, Flair won the title. Arn and Tully won the titles. Luger goes in there, he loses his title. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, if this were if this were WWE today, or even worse, if this were TNA back in the day, like Luger would have won, and everybody else would have lost, and they would be telling us that Luger had lost focus. Probably. There, there would be no... They, they, it was TNA that was really the worst at this. They'd tell you what they wanted you to believe, but if you watch it with your own eyes, it wasn't true. Mm-hmm. WWE does it sometimes as well. They're telling a story, and they booked Starcade to make the story make sense. Yeah. Is this that hard? Apparently it is. So Mark Starr here got a championship match. It was a, it was a world television championship match. How? Well, I don't know. I it, they spelled his name with one R S T A R. I'm assuming it's the same guy as Mark Starr with two R's, who was Chris Champion's brother and actually wrestled for like a decade, and then sadly died of a heart attack in 2013 at age 50. He didn't do much here. Nikita is still carrying around two TV titles for some reason. 
Yep. He squashed Star quickly, one with a Russian sickle. Actually threw a drop kick in this match. Yeah. I was not expecting that. And then, I suppose, technically, he got a promo with Jim Ross. Really, he just screamed random syllables that aren't actually words in any language I know. You know, he doesn't really, he's not really a Russian. No. He's a guy with a normal... He's from Minnesota. Southern accent. Yeah. I guess not even Southern. Well, Flair was from Minnesota. He has Southern accent. But anyway, so you would think, like, you wouldn't think, you'd know. If this was real, and he was a Russian who had come to this country, mm-hmm. he was living here now, You would his English would get better. At some point. It's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't understand a word he says now. And a year ago, I could understand, like, most of his promos. Sure. Why are they getting worse? What's going on? I don't have an answer. It ain't me. <laughs> Help me out here, Nikita. By the end, I was able to determine that he was the TV champ, the only TV champ, and Dusty was the only USA champ, and he was going to win the stampede. Kevin Sullivan versus Rick Ryder. It was wearing Lance Storm's gear, I mean. It was, actually. <laughs> yeah. Kevin Sullivan beat the fuck out of this guy, and I loved it. Yeah. I'm a sadistic man. Hey, Kevin Sullivan Sullivan never has a boring squash (laughs) match. No. Ever. I watch pro wrestling to see somebody get beat up. Rick Ryder got beat up. But you know, when you think about it, like, Sullivan's a really short guy. Mm -hmm. He's a very, very, very strong man. Oh, clearly. But he doesn't look, I mean, he's got kind of a big belly, and he doesn't look like the Road Warriors. He doesn't look like Luger. He doesn't look like Nikita. He's kind of just a short, he's, sort of pudgy guy. He's not a bodybuilder. He's yeah. a power lifter. So what he needs to do is get in there and beat the shit out of guys. <laughs> and that's what he does. He threw him around repeatedly, slapped the hell out of him, pinned him with a foot stomp where he just jumps in the guy's stomach. Just a massacre. I loved it. It was awesome. And then, the highlight of the whole show. Tony, you got to put on a split screen right here. Vinny is going to play Luger. As I would, yep, naturally. Exactly. And I will play J.J. Dillon in the yes. background. I'm behind Luger. So Lex does all the talking. Lex says, Tony Savani, the four horsemen we delivered at Starcade. Tully and Arn delivered. They beat the Road Warriors. They're still World Tag Team Champions. I should look at the camera like Lex does. Ric Flair delivered. Ric Flair beat Ronnie Garvin and won that World Championship for the fifth time. And me? I went toe-to-toe with a legend like Dusty Rhodes. I proved I belonged. I proved what I'm capable of. I am an athlete with no equal. Now it's time for me to dominate. It's time to fulfill my destiny. This will be the year when I achieve everything I set out to accomplish. And he walks off. And JJ also walks off. He had nothing to say. He was... Bounces, as they said in the (laughs) 80s. He was just face palming and eye rolling. Just disgusted with Lex. There is no subtlety here. No. Not one bit. Not one bit. Just an amazing scowling. JJ was so great here when he didn't say a word. Bobby Eaton versus Rex King. You know, it was weird, this match here. I love Bobby Eaton. Yes. But in this match, all I could think was, why are you not idiot-proofing this match? He gets in there with his Rex King. He tries his high spot early. It gets fucked up. He tries another high spot. It gets fucked up. I'm like, Bobby! Why? He suplexes the guy, and then he just kind of goes to work on him. Mm -hmm. And then later, he actually let the guy make a comeback. Yes, he did. And I'm like, did you learn nothing? (laughs) This match got a lot of time. But then, but then, it suddenly struck me. Who the fuck am I to judge Bobby Eaton? Well, there's that, too. He was way, way, way better than I was. Mm -hmm. So, what the hell do I know? I don't get it. (laughs) It's like high-level math, way over my head what he was thinking in this match. But he's Bob Eaton, so whatever. Before we're talking about the match, match. I want to mention real quick that Jim Ross on commentary is talking about all the stars next week who are going to be on the show, including, as he said, Ron Simmons, the great black athlete. Yeah. Okay. Well. And he's not wrong. He is black. Yeah, he is a great he is athlete. a great athlete. Yeah. So, I mean, that does cover all the bases. I suppose so. Probably wouldn't be a term you'd use today, but. Yeah. So, Rex King had a decade-long career, future Raw superstar, 
But he is... If I had not already given out the worst wrestler of all time of the week, it was stolen from Rex King. Horrible. He was terrible here. Horrible. He's fucking everything up with Bobby Eaton. Yeah. (laughs) Late in the match, Bobby goes to throw Rex King out of the ring. Now, as we've discussed many times in this show, I was a terrible wrestler. I got thrown through the ropes a lot. I managed to do it every single time without killing myself. You grab the ropes at this end, you reach through the other, plant on the apron, you roll outside. Rex King gets thrown through the ropes. He gets no hand on the ropes. He gets no hand on the apron. <laughs> he goes torpedoing into the cement like this, just upside down. How did he not die? Well, he didn't land on his head very hard. I suppose so. It's just a stupid way to fall out of the ring. On your head is stupid. Yeah. Use your hands to break your fall. Like, I shouldn't have to explain that to a human. Gravity is pulling you down. Put your hands out to break your fall. But... He tried to break his fall with his forehead instead. Eaton cut him off. He won with an avalanche back suplex. You know, it's funny. I guess when I think about it, you know who else used to do this was Buddy Wayne, who was also a way better wrestler than me. Maybe the problem was they never took enough risks with these idiots. Could be. I'd watch him go over these matches with guys, and I'm just like, you know this is going to go wrong. (laughs) But he was determined and to it make often it work. Did. But he was, he had he had high hopes. I guess you just got to try yes. to get better. Who would have ever thought? Mike Rotunda versus Thunderfoot number one. I guess he was wearing a neon green bodysuit. I guess he got new gear. What a horrible outfit! So the bell rings and suddenly Kevin Sullivan's back. He wants to talk to Rotunda right now after the match has begun. So Rotunda ignores him, and so Sullivan joins the commentary team. What I loved about this is he had a couple of pearls of wisdom, such as he is floundering in the seas of life. <laughs> this is one of the things he said. There's no such thing as dreams. I was up there. This guy is wrestling bozos. He's out here wrestling bozos. So after he drops these pearls of wisdom... They go back to JR, and JR goes, You know, Sullivan brought up some very valid points. <laughs> <laughs> like, which ones? He was resting a bozo He's here. floundering the seas of life. He was floundering. He said, this is the Florida champion, a very prestigious title. He used to be one of the biggest stars in this business, not out here resting bozos. So, you go to a job you hate and then go home to someone you don't care for? What? Is that what JR's talking about? Oh. One of Sullivan's valid points? I don't know. So, foot number one throws Rotunda outside, as Sullivan goes to get in his face. They get in a shoving match, but Sullivan puts his finger in Rotunda's chest, says, your problem's not with me, it's with yourself, now go kick that guy's ass. And so Rotunda hit the ring and kicked that guy's ass. He starts beating the fuck out of Thunderfoot, chases him outside, Sullivan is very pleased to see my, uh, Rotunda so aggressive He's now leaving the ring to attack his foe. Rotunda, he shouts, eat his lunch! I always like to eat his lunch as a threat. Yeah, it's like Mark years Man. years later in WCW, there was a promo with it was the ball, ball bearing. Ball bearing, yeah. Yeah. And I never heard the guy speak English in my life. I don't even, honest to God today, I don't know if he can speak English. I presume he can. But in the most broken English imaginable, he screamed, we will eat you lunch! Not, we will eat your lunch. No. We will eat you lunch. I gotta find this. It's so good. <laughs> well, sure, we'll get to it. I didn't even try to accurately recreate it, because I could not. <laughs> no, you were not the ball bearer. No. We will eat you lunch. So, Rotunda ate his lunch, one with an atomic drop, and the airplane spin. The crowd went crazy. But this is just a great little story, and the Varsity Club is already awesome. They haven't even officially formed yet. Crockett interviewed the Rock and Roll Express. I don't want to shock you. Ricky did all the talking. So you know how, like, it's been two or three weeks now. They've been talking about the Monkhouse Stampede, and every promo, the rules seem to change. Yeah. Ricky now says, as 30 guys in the match, everyone puts in a 1000 bucks, and the winner gets the pot. So it's not even, a, like, an invitational. As or much a- as 3000 he said. I, th- I thought you said like the winner would get thirty thousand. I don't know. It was it was it was weird. It's one of those where the, the the rules of the match and the contest and the tournament change from promo to promo to promo. Yeah, no one knows. All everyone knows is. At the end but of you the know night, that would make sense because last year there were some bunkhouse stampedes where the winner got like twenty five thousand. 
Then there was the one where at the end they got 100000 for one of them. Mm-hmm. Or like some were worth more than others. Yeah. More guys? They put in more money? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, that would make sense. All I know is that Ricky said they vowed to look after each other in the stampede. Mm-hmm. You, you seem skeptical. Am I the only one? Yeah. No. Robert? I see. Yeah. Ricky would do a better job of looking. It's true. So they finish and they leave. And Crockett says, all right, let's go to the ring for the main event. Yeah. I'm not done yet. Oh, oh yeah. The, the <laughs> nine fucking seconds. Yes. Dude. In how long is Robert on the air? 30 years or more? Yeah. They've never had an awkward pause this long. No. <laughs> like, we went back and... We timed it. I, I couldn't believe it. It was it was an eternity. Just David Crockett stare, smiling into the camera. And it was not me counting like Tony Schiavone. What did the other do? No. It was a nice, slow, nine, very it fucking was, awkward it was more. Like, it was the opposite. It was only like the scene in the movie. We actually hear each each tick of the clock. Tick, 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 tick. tick. Yes. It just goes on forever. And again, this show wasn't live. I don't, I don't, I'm almost positive. Main event, Michael Hayes versus Ric Flair. So, I know he doesn't like to be part of the show, but producer Tony came in about this point, and Michael Hayes came out to Bad Street USA, and Tony knows something about music, and he hated this song. Well, everybody who knows anything about music hates this song, but he <laughs> fucking sucks. I tried to defend it, and I failed. Dude, there is no defense. It's awful. It, it went the opposite way. He hated it more by the end. It's funny because like you loved it as a child, Yeah, but as a song, it fucking sucks. What do you want me well, to funny, say? The funniest thing about it, he, he said that even before Michael started to sing. It was all the guitars and instrumentation part he hated. Yes. Yeah. The so, singing was no better. No. So Michael's in there, and he's got his his teal tights and his striped underwear underneath. You can see through. That's a bad look. Yeah, because his balls are hanging out. <laughs> he's wearing no underwear. No, he was wearing underwear. Are uh, you sure? Yes. Oh, man. Unless it was only in the back. I was going to say, was out. there a cutout in the front? <laughs> Maybe. It's disgusting. He's got some bad luck with this gear. I don't think this is luck. <laughs> the PS stands for purely sexy. He's making this bad... is on purpose. You're right. He's like, making hey, bad ladies, decisions with this. Here gear. are my balls. What are you doing after the show? Apparently, it worked. Who are we to judge? So they had every single Ric Flair versus local hero match he ever saw in the 1980s. They were all exactly the same. They but all... they always work. But they were always awesome. You give them everything early. Mm-hmm. Cut Can them we off. say everything? No, I'm going to explain this. You cut them off, you give it right back. You cut them off, you give it right back. You cut them off, you give it right back. Shove the ref, ref shoves you. Mm-hmm. Cut them off, give it right back. Finally, he hits the, the leg breaker and he starts working on the leg. And then after no. like, there's maybe one minute of the nine, ten minutes mm-hmm. that is Flair getting heat. And then it's right back to Hayes again for a bunch of near falls. This wasn't even working the leg. It was... I'm going to sell for nine minutes. Then I'll hit the knee breaker and the figure four and grab the ropes and almost win. You know the best part of grabbing the ropes was? So he puts the guy in the figure four and he grabs the ropes. And the ref turns around. He lets go. The ref sees him not holding on to the ropes. But the ref notices the refs are the ropes are kind of bouncing a little. Mm-hmm. There's no one else there. Flair goes again. Let's go just in time. The ref looks. Deals are bouncing a little bit. And then... The third time, the way they're setting it up, you're thinking, Flair's going to get caught like he's just a little bit too late. Like he's going to let go and the ref's going to catch him right there. Instead, after two times, the third time, Flair is hanging from the top row. <laughs> the ref turns around and sees him. Flair doesn't let go. No. He continues hanging on the ropes. He goes, nope. <laughs> he denies it while doing it right in front of the referee. <laughs> he thought he'd get away with it. He did. He didn't get away with it. No. I love heels that are so fucking dumb. (laughs) That's what Ric Flair was. He was so great. So these fans were very outraged by Flair's chicanery. I legit thought some of them might try to jump the rail. They were so angry at his cheating. So Michael Hayes, great talker, decent brawler, and all kinds of charisma and star power, but you put him in a solo match like this where he has to play the chain wrestling babyface exposed he he's was not but you very know what good. well he's not very good but we knew that but flair made him look competent yes and i will say this i will say this this has nothing to do with rick flair 
This fucking guy could throw a right hand. Absolutely. Michael Hayes. Yeah. He got up there in the top rope and he's laying in the 10 punches. And I thought, there is nobody in WWE today no. that can do the 10 punch in the corner as good as Michael Hayes. Mm -hmm. Now, the rest, I mean, I don't know what to say. Yep. There was a moment here where Hayes ducked a clothesline and he came off the ropes and they essentially just bonked into each other face to face. Yeah. And for a split second, Time froze, and neither guy knew what to do. And then Ric Flair was the best wrestler ever, and he just grabs his nose. Yeah. <laughs> We've gone face to face. That would hurt your nose. And then he tells him, ram my face and yeah. nose into the mat. Work my nose. Yeah. So Hayes starts getting the near falls. DDT for a couple of near falls, actually. Backslide for a near fall. And he throws Flair off the top rope, hits the bulldog, but Flair gets a leg on the ropes. And then Hayes, he, hey, they're counting this down. There's less than a minute to go by this point. So Hayes does the the, the, sling, uh, the sunset flip in from the apron, and I was certain, certain that Flair was going to sit down and grab the That ropes. is exactly what I thought. And the Exactly what I thought. Instead, they went, I, I, I forgot what show I was watching and what company I was watching, because what happened was Flair fought and fought and fought, then he went down for the sunset flip, and the ref counted one, and the ref counted two, and the show went off the air. You were so angry. But you know what? I loved it. <laughs> because... They could have had a great match, and then Flair sits down on a sunset flip, grabs the ropes, gets the win, they go off the air. Mm -hmm. What would you have accomplished? You had a fun TV show. That's it. Yeah. But the way they did it, back then, this show ended, and for six fucking days. Yes. <laughs> you gotta wonder, did he get that three count? You're talking to your friends. Your friends are all, I cannot wait till next Saturday. Like, whatever was going on on Saturday, you stopped doing it because you had to be home at 6.05 to find out what happened yes. in the Ric Flair match. There was no... I loved it. There was no observer to get the results. No. You had to, uh, you had to wait that, that time. You can't do this today because of the internet and everything. Like, Raw cannot go off the air... With no finish. With no finish. It's just, it's not possible anymore. But back then, you could do it and you get people talking. You... And excited. It's a cliffhanger. It was a cliffhanger. You had to tune in next week to see if Michael Hayes won the World Heavyweight Championship. Yeah. Spoiler, he did not. He didn't. But it was a fun match. This show was a very fun change of pace. Yeah. They, sh they need to get out of the studio every two or three months like this. Yep, thought this was a very fun show. Thought it was a very good Ric Flair match. Every Flair match is exactly the same, but they're all fun. They're all good. They're all good. So we had a fun main event. We had a good angle with Mike Rotunda and Sullivan. We had the great stuff with Lex Luger and uh, J.J., we had the uh, Road Warriors, Powers of Pain stuff getting to, to uh, start. There was all kinds of stuff on this show. This is good yep. stuff. Very good show, everybody. So there you go. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. As Brian noted, NWA, NWA World Championship Wrestling, December 12th, 1987. The first thing we see, Tony Schiavone's in the garage. A limo arrives, and all four horsemen and J.J. Dillon all get out together. Yes. And... Shivani asks them about dissension. JJ and Flair speak up. They insist there is none. They're a full unit. And then they all walk into the building together. And then none of the announcers mentioned anything. I think we may have missed something there at the very beginning. Lance's theory is correct. They were arriving at the building in early December where the breakup occurred that we watched later on. That makes sense. I got it. So in other major news, actually... There's a third announcer on the show now. Before we get to that, I want to mention that even though they did arrive together, Flair and JJ both state that nothing is wrong. Mm -hmm. Flair notes that he is the team spokesman. And as he's speaking, Luger gets out of the limo. He just throws his bag over his shoulder and he just walks past everybody and gets in. Well, so did Arn and Tully did the same thing. Yes. They, but they, you could see that there was dissension. These were, yeah, this was a tense group. Yes. They were, they were not having a party in this limo. No. There were, there were some feelings going on. So, in uh, announcing news, there's now a three-man crew off and on with uh, Tony Schiavone and David Crockett, and now Jim Ross. That's right. That's right. Part of the show. Lightning Express versus Cougar J and Gary Royal. Well, they all, by the way, the announcers, Jim Ross does suggest there are problems with the horsemen. Yes. And Tony says, obviously, something is up. We're going to investigate this today. I'm like, so you haven't seen the footage yet? So they're not seen the, for the, whenever that Miami show was. I guess not. Vowed to get to the bottom. Very, let's be honest, shabbily put together the way this, is all, this all unfolded. 
So Lightning Express is Tim Horner and Brad Armstrong, who have, as we discussed here, when they are singles, they have very boring squash matches. As a team, they are much better. Cougar J is a regular on the jobber set. Gary Royal, when I first heard the name, I was I, I thought it was the guy who used to team with Cactus Jack. I was thinking of Gary Young. But this Gary Royal, it turns out, used to team with Rip Rogers. And one of the best tag team names I've heard in a while, the Convertible Blondes. Wow. <laughs> Don't even know what it means. I just like it. They, they're blonde and they drive a convertible. I guess so. Picking up chicks. Yeah, that's how you know they're rich. Yes. So the announcers are talking about how hard the horsemen were training. I did not ask you to rewind and, and double check, but I'm almost positive that at one point David Crockett claimed that Lex, in the gym, benched 800 pounds every day. <laughs> Skeptical of those That numbers. would be news. <laughs> yes. So they did some stuff, and the Lightning Express won with a double team where Armstrong uh, slammed Horner down into a leg drop, and they pinned Cougar J. Lance, your thoughts on the Lightning Express? Uh, actually, there was a spot in this match that uh, I wanted to, you know, kind of channel Brian on this one. Um, there was a like a double arm ringer, and they reverse back out of it, and they clothesline the guy. And it's like, well, why did you twist the guy's arm to make it hurt, untwist it, and then hit the guy with a clothesline? It just the kind of not good wrestling right there. It's pro wrestling. Well. You ring him out a little bit, and then you take his head off. This is an old old 1980s tag team double team spot. You twist one way, you twist the other, and you do it. The Rockers used to do it all the time and stuff. So, yeah, it's just one of those things. It's wrestling. You know, this Lightning Express here. Vinny thinks they're a lot better as a tag team. I guess they are. Yeah, you mean to go go back and watch some Tim Horner singing? They're matches. so boring as a tag team, though. You know, what they remind me of. You know, you know what pro wrestling is. Seen some, yeah. We watch it every week. Yeah. Okay. It's supposed to be like you're an amateur and then you go pro. Right? Okay. Okay. Have you ever seen amateur wrestling? I have. Okay. Sometimes it can be really exciting, but sometimes it can be pretty boring. That's fair. The Lightning Express are two amateur wrestlers who have gone pro. And they go in there and they just do a bunch of holds and they just. They ride the guy, and they twist his arm, and then they untwist it, and they clothesline him, and then they do some moves, and it's it's like the most boring nonstop action you've ever seen. That's, that's, yeah, it's yeah. weird. No, you're right. <laughs> but you know what? I may be in the minority because the fans chanted lightning when the match was over, so I guess they liked it. So the air to Lex Luger promo, it was taped backstage at Starcade after the show. And the weirdest thing about this is that they waited all these weeks to show it, because it would have been a great way to kick the angle off. So Lex and his acid-washed jeans are talking about the atmosphere of the show, what an honor it was to be in the ring with a legend like Dusty Rhodes, what a, how great it was, a great uh, part of his career to be a part of a show like this. And JJ is doing the thing where he's standing in the back, he's taken aback, he's disappointed by Lex's response, he's rubbing his brow, he's very frustrated, and suddenly he calls an abrupt end to the interview and says he and Lex need to talk. And he starts to walk away, but Lex says, no, no, this interview is over when I say it's over. And as long as you're here, JJ, from this point forward, I want no more outside interference in my matches. That's right. And JJ just turns his back and walks away. And again, this was taped weeks ago. It occurred weeks ago. Why are we only just now seeing it? Well, Lance, as a regular watcher of this show, didn't we see one almost exactly like this last week? Yeah, did they do one with uh, with Lex and he kind of like, uh, you know, the same thing verbatim? Yes. They did almost. it m- much more subtly where, where J.J. was just in the back making strange sure. faces. They didn't have the verbal confrontation between the two. No, so I'm thinking that the one last week was right after Starcade, and this one might have been a little bit later. Like, it was post Starcade, but I don't know if it was necessarily like directly after Starcade. But yeah, I thought this was pretty good. He says, you're welcome to accompany me to the ring, but I don't want any more outside interference. Yep. Barry Windham versus Trent Knight. The highlight here was when Barry whipped him into the ropes, whipped him into the ropes for an abdominal stretch, and Knight didn't know how to go into an abdominal stretch off the ropes, and so he just <laughs> fell down instead. <laughs> just... What did, what did uh, uh, David said something? He said something like, this guy... This guy can't even stand on his own two feet. It's Some, something, something like, like that. Something yeah. tried to cover for it, but it was it was mostly he just kind of sucked. He looked like <laughs> a skinny Jake Roberts, but he couldn't work like a skinny Jake Roberts. Barry pin uh, right after that, by the way, Barry pinned him with a lariat, so he knew it's time to take this one home. Yeah, and he got the promo saying he is not going to hand the Western States title over to Larry Zabisco. 
and they showed footage of Wyndham wrestling, I believe, Black Bart when Zabisco and Baby had all attacked, and they triple teamed him until Geeks cleared the ring. And then Barry, they go back to the studio. Barry challenges Larry to face him at any time because he knows that Larry can't beat him straight up. Then he stops. Like the, the, the I think it was Crockett, but he starts to pull the mic away and go to commercial. And Barry says, wait, I got one more thing to say. He says, a year ago, Lex Luger showed up in this company. I tried to steer him down the right path, but he made the biggest mistake of his life when he said he wanted to join the Four Horsemen. And then Barry left. Barry had a line in here about baby doll. He goes, when you send a woman to do a man's job, you'd better make sure she does it right. And if she ever gets in my face again, I won't be responsible for what happened to her. I was like, that was a sexist promo and you threatened to beat her. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's preposterous here in 2018. Yes. Lance, when did you start watching this NWA? When you were a kid? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm a little bit older than you guys. So um, when my parents first got cable, uh, I just I was flipping channels one Saturday night, and at 5.05, I, I came across this, and I think the first episode I saw had you know Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express and the Rock and Rolls and the Road Warriors, and I, I was hooked ever since. God, what a way to get into wrestling. Watching real good stuff. I know. It's funny how that works. Did you watch actually, WWF, I, or did you only watch NWA? Um, you know what? I um, I actually remember Black Saturday. And wow. it was one of those, like, what is this guy, and why is he putting this kind of, like, clown show on the on the, on the the wrestling that I like? And, yeah, it was uh So when it Vince bought the time slot and put his mm. yes. show on, man, oh, man. What a memory. It lasted, like, a yeah. year, right? I'm so, I beg your pardon? I think it lasted about a year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought it was, like, a month or two. No, it was a while. Fans demanded it back. Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin versus John Savage and David Isley. They did some stuff. A lot of it got fucked up, but everyone just moved on, so no one really noticed. And Garvin pinned Isley with a brain buster. Yeah, but you know what? What you said about the Lightning Express, I kind of think about Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin. Like, neither guy is very good in the ring, but you put them together, and it's all action. Yeah. Hayes does what he's good at, which is throw punches. Yeah. Garvin does what he's good at, which is strutting around and a little bit of chain wrestling. Drop the guy in his head with the brain buster. They go bam, 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 bam. The fans go nuts for him. Yeah. They're great promos. Yes. You know, the Freebirds are a hot act. Well, that's why they're challenging for the World Tag Team titles. Holy smokes. Who would have ever thought? Yes. Turns out. Well, anyway. Yeah. If only they had a guy who could work. They do. But what he's, a trio they in be. Japan. Man. So, yeah, they want the World Tag Team titles from Tully and Arn. They cut a promo about this. Well, first, by the way, for those of you keeping score, the Spam Slam of the Week was a Rock and Roll Express double backdrop. Wow. Their only appearance in the show. So the Freebirds cut a promo. They're hyping up the Bunkhouse Stampede. They're gloating about the Horsemen's problems. They're calling out Tully and Arn for the tag titles. He added, Tully's always in a bad mood. Why? Because he's ugly. And they said the Horsemen are fighting each other, and that makes them vulnerable. So they're going to be the World Tag Team champs soon. Lance, any thoughts on any of this? Uh, actually, uh, my first exposure to wrestling, of all things, was uh, world-class championship wrestling in, in uh, syndication. So the very first kind of wrestling I got into was Freebirds Von Erichs, and I always thought these guys weren't my Freebirds. Well, that's true. <laughs> these were not the Freebirds from that era. That is 100% true. That would be even more true as you get into WCW. But, uh, yeah. God, how did you stick with the wrestling for so long if that's what you started with? Um, I, you gotta kind of take what you get, you're given, uh, you you're know, just I'm, stuck with it once you become a fan. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, it was right around this time, I had been watching WWF for a while, and somewhere around here, I was at least familiar with the NWA, because the first class, class of champions is coming up in next, next spring, right? The first was, clash? Yeah. I think it's, yeah, the spring so of I, I, 80... I was, yeah. Eight, yeah. I was familiar with what was going on. So at some point, right around here is where I first started watching this show regularly. I remember watching all WWF and just horrible stuff. Like, I can't even I can't even believe I kept watching. I, I But actually, now, today, it's like, you know, 
You complain about Raw, but the, mo- the wrestling is way better the than most what I grew boring up with. thing you'll ever see on Raw is way, way technically better yes. than the crap you used to watch. I can still remember the first wrestling match I ever saw was Junkyard Dog versus The Missing Link. Oh, my God. I honestly have no idea how that ended up on TV in Seattle in 1986, but it somehow fell across my radar, and somehow I watched that and kept watching. And I've it's on some tape somebody made, and it's as horrible as you would think. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> but it, I, I, some 12-year-old me thought it was cool. Steve Williams versus Gladiator number two. Kevin Sullivan's doing commentary. And they put him in the uh, little window in the corner. This is a cleaned up Kevin Sullivan. Hey, he's got his mullet all combed. Nice. Mullet's all combed and breezy. He's, he's freshly shaven. He's got a nice leather jacket on. Like fashion model Kevin Sullivan is a rare look. He's talking about how Williams is the only guy who can beat Ric Flair. Talks about Rick Steiner and Mike Rotunda. They're talented athletes, but they're floundering with no direction. He goes on about how they need help and... Even Dr. Death, he's pointing out how, yeah, he hit a big lariat, but he should have hit, hit it sooner and won this match quicker. So Dr. Death is the biggest, scariest guy in the roster. And at one point here, he just pushes Gladiator number two into the ropes, jumps up, and does a monkey flip. <laughs> yeah. I laughed. So Doc eats the stampede and wins. You know, this match here, it's Dr. Death Steve Williams versus Gladiator number two. Yes. Not even the best gladiator. No, just... The runner-up gladiator. Some fat guy in a blueberry costume. And how long does it take him to beat this guy? Four minutes. Dude, it took forever. <laughs> and at first, I'm kind of angry. But then, I realize, this is the point of Kevin Sullivan's promo. Yeah. This is Dr. Death Steve Williams. This man is awesome. He needs a little bit of guidance, and perhaps he can go out there. And Kevin Sullivan says, become a world champion. What a burial of the UWF title. That's true. And then I realize that's why it took this guy a long time to beat this blueberry. He needs guidance. It made sense. Happy with that. So Doc cuts a promo. Says all the guys in this territory think they're tough. None of them did what I did and competed in football and wrestling, the two toughest sports there are. He made no excuses for his win over Barry Windham. He did what he had to do to get the job done. Moved on to the bunkhouse stampede, called out Luger, the Rock and Roll Express, and the Horsemen, and wore them all to watch out for him. Lance, is it fun watching these shows and just seeing where things are going? Like, this Varsity Club is about to start. Yeah, I remember the Varsity Club. A um, couple things, like, I, I love, I think you mentioned it once before, I love when, like, the babyface gets beat up in the arena, he gets jumped, and, like, all the, 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 the babyface locker room cleans it, clears out for him. That's right. Um but I thought this promo from Dr. Death was like kind of like that, that kind of classic mean guy, 80s, I'm going to you know beat everybody up promo. Yeah, he's a tough guy. You believe this guy would beat your ass. <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. That's what we need in wrestling today. The horseman, Sans Luger, came out for a promo. Oh, another thing for Lance here. Do you also follow along with the Retro Raw Nitro shows? I do. Man, what would you think about Steve Williams coming out in a karate outfit a few months ago? Uh, probably what everybody felt like when, uh, oh gosh, um, superstar Billy Graham did the same thing. Oh, come on. That was awesome. What are you doing? (laughs) Do you remember that Vinny? When superstar Billy Graham was a karate guy? I remember them both. That was fucking awesome. And I think Steve Williams could have done something with that gimmick. It was the Russo era. It was the Russo era. I mean, he ain't doing anything now. Tearing his hamstring. So... The horse can come out, and there's no Lex Luger there. Oh, here we go. Now, it's funny. Still for like two minutes in the end of this promo, they were like teasing dissension. And I said, yes, there has been tension in the horseman. It all goes back to Thanksgiving night. We had a chance for a clean sweep. We could have kept the world tag team titles. We could have regained the world heavyweight title, and we could have gotten, gotten rid of Dusty Rhodes. Could have retired a legend. Yes. And he had one athlete who had been following their game plan. Follow that game plan to victory after victory, even won the U.S. heavyweight title. Then, when his own shortcomings cost him a match, he started to question the game plan, and that was an insult to J.J. Dillon, who thought of the game plan in the first place. A personal insult. Yes. J.J. So he explains there's all these bunkhouse stampedes going on, and he wanted to make sure 
He wanted to personally guarantee the horsemen were all on the same page, so he had entered a bunkhouse stampede himself. And then he explains what we were about to see, which is kind of funny. So, it's just the horsemen. Well, first he says, I won't explain what happened, but this is what he says. He says, you can't all win a bunkhouse stampede. Yeah, his first thought was, we'll just split the money. Sure. But you can't all win. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to go down in the record books as a man who finally got a win in a bunkhouse stampede. The ref informs them there must be one winner, and JJ's a light bulb went off. Yes. This is the one chance in my career to be a bunkhouse stampede winner. Yes. And so Tully high-fived him and left. And then Arn high-fived him and left. And then, well, let's show the footage. <laughs> and the footage is... Starts with like six guys, then a second later there's four. It's Tully, Arn, Lex, and JJ. And as promised, JJ goes to the ref. It, actually, it's funny. He gets down to those four. First, Tully and Arn start celebrating right away. Because they know it's going to come out great for the horsemen no matter what. Lex is conflicted. JJ goes over to the ref, who's Bill Alfonso, by the way. Which always blows my mind to see that. And checks the ref. Sure enough, there must be one winner. You can, split, you can do whatever you want with the money. If you want to split, split it with your friends, that's fine. But somebody has to win. So JJ explains this. Tully and Arn don't hesitate. They are down with the team. Solid. And they high-five. Tully high-fives JJ, throws himself over the top rope. Arn high-fives JJ, throws himself off of the top rope. And JJ turns to Lex. And Lex is standing there with his hands on his hips. Doesn't quite know what to do. This goes on for a few seconds. Arn jumps up in the apron with the mic. Says Lex, what, what are you doing? High-five him. Throw your ass out. And Lex gets in Arn's face. Are you telling me what to do or are you asking me what to do? And Arn backs off. Backs off just make sure he's down with a with plan. And he jumps down off the apron. Lex says, I make my own decisions. I'll do the right thing. I'll do the right thing. And he grabs JJ by the head and throws him out of the ring. Place goes nuts. Yes. So Arn and Tully immediately attack him. He is fighting them both off until they whack him in the knee with a chair and they triple team him for a while until geeks make the save. They go back to the studio. Still Dylan talking. He says, at Arcade, we had the perfect plan. And I thought we had the perfect athlete, but no. Obviously, Luger's a very imperfect athlete. And he's done talking, but he's still frustrated and taking off his glasses and slamming his hand on... He's just pissed off. Arn says JJ was the guy who talked them into sacrificing their time, sacrificing their money to train Luger, how to be a horseman. And it worked out very well, but now Lex has turned on them. And that means Lex is alone. Or we'd all find out how good he really was on his own. And that was that. And Flair and Tully were there, but they had nothing to say. They were just pissed off. Says you're no longer a horseman. You were coached by the greatest of all time. You were trained by the best. Your shortcomings are your own. Not anything that went wrong with a game plan. And then says, I'm coming for you, Luger. So you better not come looking for me. Oh, this was so awesome. First off, just it's an awesome angle. But second off, how many times today do we watch a show and we're just waiting for someone to do the turn that you know is coming? And they'll shoot an angle. And then they'll shoot another angle. Yes. And then they'll shoot another angle. And you're like, are they a baby face? Or have they turned yet? Like, are they supposed or to? Or be- they'll break up and they'll be back together next week. Yes. And they yes. just go, this was like, this was his baby face turn. Yes. It's over. The- it happened. There's no question about it. The other baby faces aren't sure about Luger yet. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. They've been fighting with him for, for a year. Wouldn't make sense if they just suddenly were friends again. But this breakup has occurred. Yes. It's over. Yeah. He broke up. Awesome. I, I had the same thought. It really hit me in Lex's promo later. But yes, I was thinking about what turns are like these days. They're teased and drawn out forever. They, long after the fact when it should happen, that it, it, it finally happens. By then, no one cares. This was, and we, like I said, we'll get into it even more with Lex's promo. This was set up fine. It made total sense. They built it up to make you want to see it. They delivered, and then they moved on. I do have one problem I'll get to in a moment. But Lance, your thoughts on this? This big uh, angle. Uh, second time the horseman broke up. Uh, I personally think they should have this on, you know, DVD at the at WWE Performance Center and and teach you know the writers and stuff like that how to how to do stuff like this. That's right. Should have it. I don't know what they watch there, but this is like a great. 
Well, the problem with this is it was it was a long time in the making. So I think that we're watching it every week, and so we see the buildup, we see the whole deal. You know, if you just showed someone this, like, cold, I don't know if it would be the same as it is when you've been watching the show every single week. True, true, true that. But this was awesome. Ron Garvin versus Larry Stevens. The highlight of this was the fan cha- uh, screaming, Come on, Ronnie, put him in a pretzel. He didn't. He did not put him in a pretzel. Dude. He did stomp on both to- toes and both sets of fingers, which amused David Crockett greatly. And he did the full Garvin stomp and sat on him and won. And Ronnie cut a promo after the break. This was bizarre. <laughs> he goes, that was an easy win. He says, the NWA is the best. No cartoons. Yes. The biggest money and the biggest prizes. And the biggest egos. Now, keep in mind, a year later, he's in WWF. Sure. So it's funny to hear him saying this here. Vows to win a bunkhouse, uh, the bunkhouse stampede, because there's a bunch of qualifiers in the big one. Says he's coming back for Flair. 98's going to be his year. And then he adds, I might be coming after you, Dusty, because you have a title as well. The U.S. title. Thought, how about that? That's weird. And then, and then, the common man, Ronnie Garvin, who doesn't care about anything except just being a competitor and winning. He says, I want to win the Bunkhouse Stampede for the money. Did you see that? That's actually true. Dude, it's turning. It's coming. Can you imagine? The best part I about mean, it... It doesn't matter, but... I didn't even think about this until you pointed it out. Because you will often see... I mean, everyone here is a... Everyone, when they cut promos, call out everyone and say they want any gold they can get their hands on. So when he mentioned Dusty by name, I didn't think about it too much. Especially because then he said, I might even grab a tag team partner and grab one of the tag team titles. So he just laid it out there. Flair, Dusty, a tag about whatever he wants sure, to Sure, yeah. Now, <laughs> when you pointed out to me here exactly what he said and exactly what it meant and exactly what it meant for this guy to be saying those things. Yeah. That, that is, in fact, planting the seed. Lance, did you live through this whole Ronnie Garvin thing? In real time, back uh, yeah, in the day? Yeah, actually, I, re- I remember him both winning and losing the title, and it was just one of those, like, man, they must have a lot of faith in this. You know, you know, in hindsight, they must have a lot of faith in this guy. And it was just like, I remember watching it as a kid going, like, what, what you know, why is this guy the cha-? You know, like, you know, like, Flair, you were always like, he's a champion. This guy was like, why is this? You know what? I was watching this by now because I remember watching the, when they showed Garvin winning the title the first time. So, so Lance, when you were listening back to our shows like two years ago, when we knew that the Ron Garvin title win was coming, but he was on TV beating the shit out of jobbers, and he had that great match with Flair, and Vinny and I were like, how bad could it possibly be this guy is champion? What were you thinking when we had that, that opinion? Oh, uh, boy, you guys got a, got a lot to look forward to. And we were wrong. <laughs> it was fucking terrible. Which is weird, because like it didn't seem like it could possibly be that bad. But you know what he was like? People are going to get mad about this. He was Dean Ambrose. I was just going to say, yes. He was Dean Ambrose when wow. he won the title. Yeah. Like, everybody wanted Dean Ambrose to be the champion. Everybody wanted him to be the guy. They put the world title on him, and it was such a fucking disaster. Yes. They took the title off him, and he never came near it again. When, when I don't he, know why. When AJ won the title from Dean, it felt like he was rescuing the belt. Yeah. It felt the same weird. when Flair was getting the belt back from Garvin. Except WWE exactly didn't lose right. uh, 24% of their audience or whatever, or 30, whatever it was. Some preposterous number when they put the title on Garvin. Yeah. Mighty Wilbur and Ricky Santana versus Joe Lynn and Denny Brown. What a team. So Santana being there wrestling, lots of arm drags and hip tosses, of course, classic 80s babyface. He tags in Wilbur, who just wants to come in and shake hands, and the action just stops. This went on for a while. Ricky hit a body press and won. The mighty Wilbur is so much less fun when he's not just doing funny promos. Yeah, I don't want to watch him wrestle. Dude, he's out there wrestling. I'm just like, come on, dude. You would think putting him in there in a tag match is to protect him and you know, give him a chance no. to... No! Uh, yeah. It doesn't work. It didn't work. No. Uh, let's see. The Road Warriors got a promo. They again insisted that they, and not the Barbarian and Warlord, were the strongest guys in pro wrestling. What a way to build a feud. It's so simple. Who's stronger? They say they're strong. We're stronger. Mm-hmm. We let's must fight. fight. <laughs> it's awesome. It is. So, Hawk talks about the horsemen. Says, in every bad apple, every group of bad apples, 
There's one apple worse than all the rest, and that's you, Lex Luger. Yeah, what was that all about? I'm not sure. I was so baffled by this I guess, promo. I guess as much as Hawk hates the horseman, he admires loyalty. Yeah. And Lex was the one who was selfish and put himself above the team. Well, if you listen to Lex's promos we'll get into, Lex was not selfish. Mm-hmm. Like, Lex, Lex did the right thing, and here's Hawk. First off, Hawk is bearing Luger for being the worst guy in the horseman. After he's the one guy that had anything even resembling, like, you know, he stood up for himself. Yes. He tried to actually win. Mm-hmm. The Hawk's not down with that. <laughs> he turned on your friend. Well, you Hawk is a career tag team. team guy. And then, well, that is true. I guess you could argue that. Yeah. But then, they vowed that they're going to win the final bunkhouse stampede. And they claim, we're going to tie yeah. and collect all the money. Yeah. And I'm like, you can't tie. <laughs> Wasn't that made abundantly clear like 15 minutes ago? One guy's got to win. Then you can do whatever you want with the money. But the ref specifically said no ties. And he's out there talking about how they're going to tie. He goes, I don't care about money. After saying, by the way, that he wants to collect all the money, he says, we're going to collect the money, give it to Paul. Paul's going to manage it. What he said was, he's going to put it in the bank with the rest of our money. Sure. So the reason Hawk doesn't care about money is because he has so much money. He already has so much, he doesn't doesn't know what to do with it. I see. So he, he's not fighting for the money because he's already got money. He's right. fighting because he likes to beat people up. Mm-hmm. What did you think of this, Lance? Uh, actually, I was going to mention, I actually saw the Road Warriors in a bunkhouse stampede in 1986. Wow. And uh, they did that exact uh, deal where they uh, were the last two guys in the ring. They, they they threw everybody else out, and Paul Ellering, you know, they were ready to go at it. Uh, Paul Ellering uh, jumped in, flipped a coin. Uh, Hawk jumped out first, and Animal won. So you can only have one winner. Yeah. Man, oh, man. God, this stuff is so great. Yeah, this was, <laughs> that was really, uh, it was, <laughs> yeah. it was, you know, it was in Chicago. It was really awesome. It's so logical. Yes, everything the makes road sense. Road Warriors win the thing in their hometown. Mm-hmm. They're about to fight because they're competitors. Their manager gets in, flips a coin. That's how they choose. He says, one, if you guys fight, one of you might get hurt. I can't have that. And the fans didn't get upset that they didn't fight. Oh no! They it was they they were they were into it, but then all of a sudden, like when Paul came in, it was just sort of like uh, they kind of figured out what was going on, and everybody went nuts. It was really cool. Wow! They would rather see the team see the team stick together. They would rather see friends, yes, than friends beating each other up. Yes, man. Flair and Dylan come out for a promo. Flair admits that he liked Luger. Heavy emphasis on that D and liked. So Luger was one of the greatest athletes he'd ever been associated with. But he compared him, I believe, the comparison he was making was, Lex is like a good-looking woman who was then lousy in bed. Not even to bed. He said that every single night, he says Luger has a great body. He has the best body in the business. But every night, women with great bodies ask me to take them upstairs. But if they have a great body and they can't go, I leave them in the lobby. I see. So I don't know what it is that he can he can smell it. I guess That's how he chooses who to bring up. And right, because you can't uh, if they have a great body. It's not visual. Yes, he's got to look at their eyes. Sure, or something. He warned Lex to find a new career because this was his world and he controlled it. I thought this interview was awesome. It was an awesome Rick. I Flair thought promo. Rick Flair yeah. could cut a great promo. <laughs> Good on the mic. I don't know about you two. Uh, that was just, it. Was a Ric Flair, Jim Crockett like man? He owns the joint and step out of his way. It was just awesome. This guy's great. Sting versus Tommy Angel. Ugh. Sting was a lot less insane in the ring this week. Was a, I, he was very calm. In fact. I just noted that he sold more than you would think. He even got thrown out of the ring at one point, even though he just landed on his feet and jumped right back in and beat the guy. Yeah. He get, went for a stinger. I uh, went for the Evader bomb, and Tommy Angel got the knees up, and then eventually Sting just hit the stinger splash and Scorpion and won. My greatest disappointment was he didn't do a promo afterwards. Yeah, because Sting's like, promos in this era were amazing. How do you not have Sting do a promo? Now, speaking of amazing promos. Now, when we began this show, I talked about how... I forget what I said, but you were disappointed that I was not blown away by this year episode of World Championship Wrestling. Yes. Now, I was thinking of the show as a wrestling show, because a lot of the matches... In fact, I don't think any of the matches are, are memorable in any way. This promo. Everyone needs to watch this promo. Before you get to the promo, i got a couple things i got to say. 
I cannot yet bring myself to put Lex Luger in the Hall of Awesome, but man, is he teetering. He... He has awesome days. God, he has so many great things in his career. It's just everyone fucks everything up with him. Uh, he was so over. Any time they did any with it, anything with him in WCW post-95, he was so ridiculously over, and they fucked it up every single solitary time. And it was not his fault. It was like, let's give him the title and take it off of him five days later at Hog Wild. Let's uh, have him do this. It was just over and over we saw it. He's cut so many fucking great promos here in the 80s. The one thing I will say is, I didn't mention this, but when they did the angle where Luger turned babyface and he starts attacking the horseman, he was hideous. Well, yeah. He was not good. <laughs> like, he's very passable in the ring as like a heel, you know, just beating up Methodically, jobbers. slowly... Yeah. Or, Taking his time. And, sure. Or, or being the heel on the opposite ed, and side of the ring from like a good babyface worker. Mm -hmm. But man, you put that guy in there as a babyface just running wild, he's terrible. Yeah. So I think that counts against him. But this was like, I think, the best Lex Luger promo of all time. I would At be least stunned I've if it was not. <laughs> so Lex admits he's hurting. He's it's very emotional. Very emotional these days. And he has to admit some of the great memories of his life came with the Four Horsemen. So these fans were into everything all throughout the show. Calling the bad guys chickens and wimps. And calling out moves they want to see the good guys do. But when Lex Luger came out to speak his mind after this, they were all shushing each other. Everyone stopped making noise. Yeah. You have to hear Lex Luger explain himself. They're, they're chanting his name at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And he starts his soliloquy. And they're still chanting his name. And then he says, these horsemen live their life to the fullest, and I have had some cherished moments with them. Mm. And all of a sudden, you hear all these people going, shh. Yes. And it's deadly quiet in the building. So, he says, when I first arrived in this company, I had some decisions to make. And Barry Windham had, knew me well. He warned me to stay away from the four horsemen. And I spit in Barry's face. And I have had to live with that decision for the past year. And I got to admit, a lot of the things we've done, that I have done, as part of J.J. Dillon's game plan, a lot of it weighed on my conscience and kept me up at night. But it was a game plan. And we had a game plan going into Starcade. I knew, despite that game plan, I was going to win or lose that match on my own. And then the chair came into the ring. I followed the game plan. And the rest was history. So it's after Starkey, he's lost the U.S. title. And he notes, Arn Anderson didn't have a belt for a while. Ric Flair himself didn't have a belt for a while. But as soon as I lose a belt, I felt that knife in my back. Yes, he said, before Starcade, I had a belt. None of them did. I always supported them nonetheless. Yes. And then the day after, they come home with the belts. I don't have a belt, and they stab me in the back. He's right! He's exactly right. And they re-aired the footage of Lex throwing Dylan out of the rain to win in Miami. And then the post-match attack. And Lex is saying, you know, I haven't actually seen this footage. It's very hard for me to watch. I'm not enjoying watching this. Because <laughs> they beat him up. So they go back to the studio and Lex says, so from this point, no more shortcuts for Lex Luger. I am going to become the athlete everyone knows I could be. And the horseman made two mistakes. The first was not getting the job done. And the fans by this point, are they love Lex Luger. And they're chanting his name. They're cheering their heads off. And from dead silence to this raucous ovation, and Lex gets thrown off his game. Yeah. And he stops. And he takes a breath. He says, I got to admit, in all this emotion, I've lost my train of thoughts. Can everyone please be quiet? And they did. <laughs> That's the astonishing part. They were quiet. So he strips off his shirt, and he says the second mistake was pissing me off in the first place. They stepped on the toes of a lot of guys over the years, but they stepped on the wrong toes in Lex Luger. That's right. He vowed to fulfill his potential and become the greatest star the sport's ever seen. That's it. This was unreal. This was so great. <laughs> because... And let me tell you something here. I want to ask Lance, because he was watching this live. When this guy said... I vow to become the biggest star that wrestling has ever seen. We know in hindsight that did not happen. But like if you were watching it at the time, mm -hmm. 
he cut this promo, you had to be thinking, this fucking guy's going to be the biggest star wrestling's ever seen. Right? Am I out of my mind? No, it was great. Lance, what do you recall from this the first time you saw it? Um, Just like, you know, Hogan was, you know, Hogan, and, and, you know, this guy had the build, and, you know, he's decent in the ring, he was better than Hogan, and it was like, man, like, this, that's kind of like where I picked this episode, it's like, I remember this promo, like, he's gonna go out there, and he's gonna kill the Four Horsemen, like, man, oh man, you know, like, I just, I, I really, you know, like, legitimately thought he was gonna be the next big thing. He had a better physique than Hogan. Yeah. He had better hair than Hogan. Yes. Probably was a better worker at this point than Hogan, or at least he was, I mean... At worst, they probably were of similar wrestling ability at this point. Sure. Right? Yeah. 1987 Hogan. Late 87. Match with Andre, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, he was fine, but younger. Much younger. Much younger. Mm-hmm. I mean, Hogan was a great cartoon promo. Yes. But this was like a great real-life emotional promo. Man, oh, man. And like we say, and I'm risking repeating myself here, but... I understand every single... I understand the motivations of every single character involved. Yeah, everybody thought they were right. Yes, and, and I understand why they thought they were right. I get why the horsemen were all mad at Lex. I get why Lex is mad at the horsemen. I get why this all built to a head and couldn't continue. And the babyface is doing what he feels is right. And J.J. Dillon, the heel... Like, Lex did go by the game plan, and he lost... His ego cannot handle that. So he has to claim that Luger did not abide by the game plan. Of course. It cannot, s- it cannot possibly be JJ's fault. No, it's got to be this other idiot's fault. This was so awesome. Now, before we move on, I just want to add that somewhere on the show, I forget exactly where, but JJ was comparing himself, comparing his game plan to the game plan of the legendary NFL coach Vince Lombardi. <laughs> and in the process of trying to say this, he came very, very close to talking about Vince McMahon. He goes, the legendary Hall of Famer Vince McLombardi. Yes. Never heard of Vince McLombardi before, but... You learn something new every day. I do. Larry Zabisco versus Rocky King. So it's... Crockett and Ross are calling the match. And the uh, Crockett is talking about how, you know, Baby Doll, she knows all these wrestlers so well. And he realizes he's like halfway through calling her a rat and doesn't know how to talk himself out of this and get himself out of this hole. And Ross is there to say, you're right, Jim or David. She, she scouts them all very diligently. <laughs> Saved his day. So Larry squashes Rocky, pins him with a neck breaker. <laughs> and Larry cut a promo. These fans are fired up now. That Lex thing really set him off. They got Larry off his game. He had to, he had to stop what he was telling, uh, saying to tell them to shut up a few times. So he talks about all the money he has, assets totaling a million dollars. He's wrestled around the world as a gigantic superstar, he claims, for 13 years. Yeah. And has amassed assets worth one million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. He vows to be world champion someday and said Barry's Western States title will be the first step on his stairway to heaven. Gotta say one thing about, like, there's a lot of great stuff on these shows. Like, the interviews are so much better than they are today. Like, some of the workers are as good or better than the really good guys today. Not as quite as athletic and that sort of thing, but the one big difference is the guys today and the women have so much better cardio than these guys back then. Yes. Larry didn't do a fucking thing in this match. It's Larry Zbysko. He barely moves. He wins a quick match against Rocky King, and he's gasping his way through this promo. (gasps) I wrestled for (gasps) 13 years. (gasps) I'm like, are you going to die? What the fuck did you do here? Nothing. Larry Zabisco. Nikita Koloff versus Thunderfoot number one. Thunderfoot or Thunderfeet, Tony? Had that discussion again here today. Tony's throwing his voice behind foots. Yeah. So we see Thunderfoot number one almost every week. He was fucking horrible this week. (laughs) Like, I don't know why I expected more out of Thunderfoot number one. I don't either. What are you, <laughs> what are you a, expecting? He was atrocious. He's any random geek with a costume on. So he's tripping and stumbling everywhere, and Nikita kills him and wins, wins with the sickle. So Steve Williams is still carrying the UWF World Heavyweight Championship belt. I have no idea when he just stops. Even weirder, Nikita has unified the NWA and uh, UWF TV belts, but he's still carrying both of them. That's just a pain in the ass at this point. 
So he says being a champion is what it's all about. He's got a belt. His superpower partner, Dusty Rhodes, has a belt. Anyone, anyone wants, uh, wants to challenge me, they can sign a contract, I'll face him in the ring. He talks about the Bunkhouse Stampede, how he's afraid of no How man. in the world did you get any of this? I speak fluent Nikita. Oh, I used to. <laughs> now he's like Andrade C. and Almas out there without Zelina Vega. Yeah. He's just rambling his way through this promo and fake... It's a fake broken English yes. accent. Yes. So he says it's his world as much as it is Ric Flair's. Lance, any thoughts on any of this? Uh, je t'ota. God, he did keep saying that. He did. It's like his fallback. It is. Whenever he loses track, just throw that out there. It's Russian. No one knows what it means. Keep going. Sure. They replayed the same Dusty Rhodes hype video for the Bunkhouse Stampede. Except I think this was a different one. Am I wrong? I think it was the same one. He moved like a cow again. Okay, I forgot the move last week. I'm pretty sure he moved. Yeah, for sure, pretty sure it's the same one. And his voice got so high. <laughs> you know what's funny? I don't know why it's funny, but like, have you heard Paisley talking lately? A little bit. She's a little tiny baby, and so her voice is like super high. Yes. Because she's a little baby. Well, it would be very weird if it was not. So she's got this book that we read where there's a train, and it goes, woo-woo, and I read it to her, and I do that, uh-huh. right? So she tries to recreate it, and she goes, woo, woo. It's like the lowest thing. It's like, who always tried to make fun of Ric Flair and do the woo, and it was just like horrendous? Was it Hogan? A lot of guys. Where he'd like come out on Nitro, and he'd go, I'm Ric Flair. Woo. That was even too high. He'd just do like a really low woo. woo. It's like, why can't you do a woo? Why can't your voice go that high? I need to record this someday. Main event. The main event? The main event. Excuse me, this is the main event of the television show? <laughs> this week it is. Okay. The Midnight Express versus Italian Stallion and St- Italian Stallion and George South. This went just long enough for Cornette to cut one promo without breathing. And they won with a flapjack. So they hit the move, and Cornette poses on the apron, and Eaton's standing tall, and Lane's making a cover, and they're all right there, and the ref counts three. And they cut to the podium, 10 feet away. Here's the new breed calling, calling out the Midnight Express and talking about all the things they're going to do to him. And the show is about to go off the air. Yes. So they've just got to rush their way through this promo. Here is what I've determined about this new breed, okay? First off, this promo is horrible. Like, everybody involved was terrible. So they're both weird dudes. Uh-huh. That's clear. You know what I mean? Like, even by the standards of pro wrestlers. But to me, Chris Champion seems like a normal dude who's pretending to be a really weird dude. Whereas Sean Royal is just a weird fucking dude being himself out there. Like, Champion's cutting this promo and he's doing the futuristic gimmick and that sort of thing. But, like, you can see a normal guy there, like, doing this promo. And Sean Royal's in the background just making weird faces. Yes. And, like, everything he says is weird and he stands weird and he just kind of stares weird. You know what I mean? No, you're definitely right. He's just a weird fucking guy. <laughs> you're definitely right. Chris Champion does seem like a normal human. Yeah. Royal is not. Royal is not a normal human. So, they're calling out the Minute Express, Zardian War Beast, or whatever the hell they say. And then that squid, Jim Cornette. Yeah, squid. A squid. <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't know. And they promised to take the NWA by storm and win the U.S. tag titles. And they added, just as the show was going off the air, be sure to see us in the bunkhouse stampede. You've got to see what we're going to wear. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to see what we're going <laughs> to wear. The tag line. they got to show up as robots. I guess. Or yeah. something. And that's the end of the show. I thought that show was great. That was a strange ending Strange and abrupt ending to a show. I thought that show was great. The Luger stuff is must-see. Lance, you chose a great show there to review. Any uh, thoughts on what? the last few segments there? Uh, just wanted to say that uh, Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express are like my, that's like my favorites, and uh, I try to refrain from cursing the entire time, but the new read, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what is the well, fuck with I, these I guys? Don't have, I don't know. Would you have a good answer? For what the fuck, the new breed? Well, let- well, let's get funky like a monkey. So we all owe him a debt of gratitude. And I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, what do they say? Dedicate this show, NWA World well, Championship now Wrestling. That's a burden on me. From December of 1987. If I have a bad show, you're going to be so pissed off now. We always have a bad show. So well, I mean, we're by my standards. Ah, get out of here.
NWA World Championship Wrestling, December 19th, 1987. Vinny begged me to talk for hours. Now he's dying to move on. Go ahead, Vinny. Well, do you have more to say about Mr. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll come up here and there. Okay. I got a million things I could say. Regardless, this NWA show here was awesome. A great show. It was a great show. It opened with clips of Arn Anderson versus Mighty Wilbur. When Arn was in such dire straits against Mighty Wilbur, that J.J. Dillon had to attack for the DQ. And then Wilbur went for uh, J.J., but Tully Blanchard ran in to make the save, and the horsemen are double-teaming Mighty Wilbur. When Lex Luger makes the save, and that's where it cuts off. To be continued. To be continued? I couldn't believe my eyes. Yeah, all of this over Mighty Wilbur. Mighty Wilbur and Arn Anderson is weird enough. J.J. Dillon running in to save Arn Anderson from Mighty Wilbur is preposterous. Yes. And then a horseman beatdown on the Mighty Wilbur, who gets saved by Lex Luger. If you'd have told me this while watching the show, I would have I would have said you were lying. You would think this would lead to... This is paranormal talk radio. This may be paranormal talk radio. I mean... You would not. You could be forgiven for assuming they would do a tag match off of this with Lex Luger and Mighty Wilbur, the greatest physique disparity in tag team history. It's up there. So the show then in the studio opened with David Crockett interviewing Sting. Sting announces. I'm not sure why it's Sting job. Sting's job to announce this, but he does. Robert Gibson has been hurt in the bunkhouse stampedes, and Sting has volunteered to take his place. And we will later learn to uh, team with Ricky Morton. It's a real injury, by the way. Yeah. He said he felt it in his bones he would have a title match against Ric Flair soon. He said Flair was the better wrestler, but he was bigger and stronger, and he proved this by flexing and hollering and flexing and hollering and flexing and hollering. Sting was the best. I was very confused by Sting's promo because I thought he was talking about stepping in for Robert Gibson in the bunkhouse stampedes. I was not sure how he was going to do that. Like he's going to be in twice at the same time? Well, presume I guess... Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> How would that work? Yeah. He's it, in it. I, well, yeah. I, 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 it's I, like you being in the greatest Royal Rumble, and then Rusev can't make it, so you're going to replace him. Yeah. How? Well, the Royal Rumble guys come and go. Uh, yeah, that's true. So there's that. So. But, uh, this yeah. is not a battle royal. No. Nikita Koloff versus David Isley. In, a, in a championship a match. A world television championship match. How did David Isley get a title shot? I'm not sure. We say this a lot about the TV title. Like, the old idea at some point was that the TV championship would be defended on TV every week, thus the name. And here is it's defended, I don't know, five every five weeks, every six weeks. And it's just random people. That is true. Shots. It is the TV title. Yeah. I guess anybody can get a shot, but it was still weird that David Isley got one. I've seen David Isley. We've been doing the show like for two years now, maybe three and we've seen David Isley a hundred times, and I was just... Maybe it's because he's usually in tag matches. It seems like he wrestles the Midnight Express a lot. But watching him in a, in a, in a singles match of some length here, what an amazingly, overwhelmingly average man. Yeah. He's not... Like every jobber they've got? No, well, some jobbers are spectacularly terrible. Some jobbers, there's the George South level, who are actually pretty good. David Isley looks like you picked a guy out of the mall. He's not skinny. He's not fat. He's not big. He's not even skinny fat. He's just a guy. And you threw him in a pro wrestling ring, and he had just enough training to not embarrass himself and not get anyone hurt, but no better than that. Hmm. I was just blown away by his mediocrity. I'm blown away you've talked this much about David Isley. Nikita pinned him with a sickle. All that for that? that well, <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a geek. He's a very unique kind of geek. No, he's not. How is he any different than Cougar J? He's jigglier than Cougar J. How Jay. is he any different than Trent Knight? How is he any different than Trent Knight like Larry Stevens? Magnet, yeah, I, I don't remember Larry Stevens. Uh, Tony Suber. I, I have stuff to say about Tony Suber. We'll get to Tony Suber. That one Dusty Rhodes bunkhouse stampede promo aired again. Yeah. They couldn't just sit the guy down and do like three. I don't know. Jim Cornette cuts a promo about Dusty. Dusty, you see, he he beat Lex Luger at Starcade, and then immediately started dropping hints about retirement. And so, Cornette says this proves Dusty is slipping, and one of my men, either Big Bubba, a Sweet Stan, or Beautiful Bobby, one of my men is going to be the man who retires Dusty Rhodes, and that he explains is why I have been booking Bobby and Stan in singles matches to get them ready for this. This leads to the Midnight Express in a tag team match against Rocky King and Cougar J. This was a long what? match. Listen, got 
The Midnight Express are amazingly great. Rocky King and Cougar J are better than a lot of jobbers in the show. Why did this go 10 minutes? Well, they have a 90-minute show. And if you're going to have a match that goes longer than like two minutes, this would be the one. I suppose. Eaton was, they were just suplexing the jobbers all over the place. Eaton hit an Olympic slam. Yeah, he did. He had a flying elbow and hit the lights. Yeah. He literally hit the lights in the studio. Rocky King ends up outside. Yes. Big Bubba gets his hands on him. Yeah. When did Big Bubba stop sucking? Because he, he sucked here. Goddamn nearly killed Rocky King. <laughs> not, that's actually a good question. Because he's wrestling Hulk Hogan soon. It's not that and long. And those were good. It's next year. Yeah. He grabbed Rocky King by the neck. And he was supposed to give him a DDT outside. And it looked like a shoe DDT. <laughs> he just fell back, dropped the guy in the head, and his entire body fell on the guy's head and neck. Uh. Just splatted and killed him. So they're out there, and Stan starts dancing over Rocky King like Akeem, and Cornette compares Rocky King's head to a watermelon hitting the cement. Some classic non-stuff that would not fly material here in 1987. Eventually, after a very long match, the Midnight's won with a double flapjack. I don't think it was meant to be what you're thinking it was meant to be. It's Jim Cornette. I realize that, but like I've heard that term used a million times. I see. Double flapjack finish. David Crockett interviewed Tully and Arn, who are out there in the fancy new Four Horsemen sweatshirts. Now they've dumped Lex, and now there's only three of them. Can you imagine? This is the Four Horsemen. And they've decided, let's get some matching sweatshirts. Yeah. Maybe we can sell them. That, yeah, they're usually out there in, in, in the finest suits, or... Actual, legit athletic wear. Yeah, like ready, to, to, ready to hit the gym and, and, and kick some ass. Here they are in, like, pastel sweatshirts with a cheesy iron-on logo. Oh, man. So, do you remember back in 1998 when you and I were doing... I actually don't know if you were there. It might have just been me. It was a Battle Royal in Cloverdale and Paul Lazenby... I think I was watching. Yeah. I, was in the, I was in the crowd. They, they pantsed me, yes. threw me over the top rope. The, the army of darkness. Man, oh man. Well, 20 years later, I'm going to show oh, over Mania Weekend. You know this story? I think I do. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what it has to do with what we were just talking about. I'll tell you. So Dave stands up and he puts on his famous sweatshirt, which is in fact now famous. He's got a green and baby blue tie-dyed sweatshirt. And he... Ties it around his neck like he's going to tennis practice. Yes. And he wore this to some show, and there are like a million pictures of it all over I didn't see the, pictures. the internet and Twitter. So he go to Mania, and he's sitting next to me, and he, he puts it on again because it's cold. Yeah. So he's standing up, and he's just put it on, and I took a picture from behind, and I tweeted it out. It's, and from behind, it's a guy in jeans and yeah. a tie-dye sweatshirt. And I just wrote, it's back. Yeah. The sweatshirt's back. Paul Lazenby does not know it's Dave. And he just tweets out this fucking tirade. That motherfucker, tell that asshole to sit down, that selfish son of a bitch. <laughs> just fucking buries him. And then he later finds out it's Dave. Anyway, I got my revenge 20 years later. But, point of this is, Dave's got this sweatshirt. And so it's the talk of the weekend. And finally, you know, our buddy Garrett asks him, where did you get this sweatshirt? And Dave says, I got it at Hot Topic. Because he was there, they got all the Bullet Club stuff, he was checking it out. Mm -hmm. And they had some sale, get a sweatshirt for $15. Sure. That's the one he got. So anyway, the point of all of this is, I'm at the store today, and some, like, teenage girl walks by in the same sweatshirt. Are you telling me there's more than one Hot Topic in the world? No, the point is, I think it's a woman's sweatshirt. I'm sure it On is. top of everything else. I'm sure it was that, yeah. Oh my god. So Only Dave. The horsemen are wearing women's sweatshirts, is what you're saying? It may be. They were pastel. And Dave's conclusion was, he's ahead of his time, fashion-wise. Yes. In five years, everybody's going to be wearing this. Hey, stranger things have happened. Yes. Man buns, for example. So Tully repeats the horseman line. Everyone loses once in a while. Everyone loses titles once in a while. But Luger, when he lost that U.S. title to Dusty Rhodes, he should have come to the back to the horsemen, accepted responsibility, apologized to them for losing, and promised to get that title back. 
Instead, it's never his fault. It's J.J. Dillon's fault. It's Tully Blanchard's fault. It's not Lex's fault. And yes, he said, they had attacked Lex Luger, but they didn't want to put him out of wrestling. They wanted to punish him for making a mistake. Like when your child steals a cookie, and yeah, I, I think he said, yeah, you pat him on the bum. <laughs> oh, yeah. Same thing. Sure. So then they show the angle that opens the show, where Luger comes out to save the mighty Wilbur. God Damn, these people love watching Lex Luger clear the ring. And then he, he destroys the horseman, sends the packing. Ross hits the ring to interview him. Lex says the horseman tried to take Lex, him out. Lex gasps the he, following. He was not doing, he was not in, 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 in peak shape here. He says the horseman had tried to take him out, but failed to get the job done. He warned them to watch out for him. They go back to the studio. Vowed no more shortcuts no for more Lex shortcuts. Luger. They go back to the studio. And Tully has had his piece, and now it is time for Arn's piece. I've seen a lot of Arn Anderson promos. I don't know if I've seen five better than this one. This was awesome. He says he and Lex are both intelligent men. So he's going to talk to Lex like men. He's not going to holler. He's not going to scream. He's not going to raise his voice. He's just going to make his point. He says JJ had been the one to say, hey, there's this kid in Florida. I think he'd make a good horseman. I'm going to bring him up, and you guys can be a part of the group. And Tully and Rick and Arn had done all they could to bring Lex up to their level, and Lex had paid them back by thinking he could do better on his own. And now he was, in fact, on his own. Rhodes ain't going to help you, he says. Koloff ain't going to help you. The Rock and Rolls, Wyndham, nobody else. You're alone, and I'm going to take care of you. I earned the name of the Enforcer by taking care of problems, and that's what I'm going to do. I am doing 0% justice to this promo. It was out of this world great. I love this feud. I understand everyone's motivations. Everything makes sense. All the characters are consistent. It's perfect. Yeah. Steve Williams versus Trent Knight. Trent Knight is a low-rent Magnum TA. He's a very skinny Magnum TA, yeah? Yes. I love that Steve Williams is like the biggest, scariest, strongest guy in the company. But sometimes, like this, he still comes out and he just does takedowns and he uses leverage to put his opponent on the mat and works him over with holes. Yeah, he's a wrestler. It would be like if Braun Strowman came out and started wrestling like Daniel Bryan, except he was good at it. Funny you mention Braun Strowman. Yeah. Dr. Death and Braun Strowman both do a, a power slam. They do. So, Dr. Death hoists his low-rent Magnum TA up on his shoulders, and he literally sprints from one corner to the other, turns around at the corner, and then just slams this guy in the middle of the ring. So he ran about 35 feet. Sure. Corner to corner and then back again. Yeah. Why doesn't Braun do this? Well, You're not watching a lot of Raw. No. But Braun's finish is, he stands in front of the guy, he like lifts him up on his shoulder and just power slams him where he's standing. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I... like Davy Boy Smith does a running power slam. Are we sure Braun can run and not fall down? Are you fucking kidding me? That guy runs like a crazy man. That guy would outrun you. Well, that's probably true, actually. He'd outrun He'd outrun a lot of guys. Yeah. He's very, very fast. Why doesn't he run? It looks so bad. Like, why do Davy Boy Smith and Steve Williams have a futuristic power slam compared to Braun Strowman? I don't know. It's like he's in the Stone Ages. Lift, slam. You just designed the best Braun Strowman shirt of all time. <laughs> that's better than get these hands. He's not even a puncher. No. So, after out-wrestling this man, Steve pressed him over his head like a dozen times. Messed around a bit, moment of the stampede, a very good squash. Then he cuts a promo. He is, in fact, still holding oh. this UWF title, and he draws attention to it. Like, he, he hints at the fact that the UWF is dead, but he says, I went through a lot of men to get this title. I'm not going to give it up easy. He says, they're, they keep going back to the Starcade match. He says, Barry Wyndham was a great wrestler. Hopefully, next time he's got a man beat, he will do what it takes to finish him off. So Barry comes out to speak up for himself. Barry's hurt, by the way. He's hurt, and he's also a giant. Yes. Like, Steve Williams is a big, big, big man, and Barry looks like four inches taller here. So, he says Doc is a fine wrestler. Doc is still the UWF champion. But the next time he's got an opportunity to pin Doc, he's not going to let it pass by. And he says this, and he walks away before Doc can say anything. And Doc just smiles at him and says he likes to see fire in a young guy because he knows what's Dude, in store. You're not doing this justice at all. 
This is angry, crabby, surly, gruff Steve Williams. And Barry Windham vows to beat him the next time they meet. And Dr. Death flashes the most horrifying smile of all time. (laughs) And then he says, the good doctor is going to make a house call. Yes. (laughs) I was like, that's the fucking greatest. That's the best catchphrase of all time. Can we turn this guy heel like right now? That was so awesome. He scared the shit out of me when he smiled. He's terrifying. He is utterly terrifying. Speaking of great heels, the Sheep Herders got a promo. Well, Vinny, let's make it official. Oh, it's without saying. The fucking Sheep Herders... The newest entries. The bloody sheep herders. The bloody sheep herders. Are in the bloody hall of bloody awesome. The bloody hall of awesome. This God. Time. Our newest entries into the hall of awesome. And by the way, I'm glad they have been entered into the hall of awesome because I have an announcement to make here. Oh. As of today, it will henceforth be referred to as the Matt Cleary Memorial Hall of Awesome. I am down with that. Yep. It is the now the Matt Cleary Memorial Hall of Awesome. It has two new entries. Yes. The fucking Sheep Herders. Not the Bushwhackers. Absolutely not. God bless them. Yeah. I'm sure they made more money as the Bushwhackers. I'm sure they did. I don't care. But the Sheep Herders are the newest members of the Matt Cleary Memorial Hall of Awesome. I do the shows. and I, all, all the shows you watch. NWA, NXT, pay-per-views. Uh, raw, nitro, whatever. And I, 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 I'm i looking halfway at the screen and half at my computer typing. Sometimes I'm watching a show on my computer. Like, I, I don't even have the window with the show open. I can just hear it while I'm reading Twitter or whatever. These sheep herders appeared on screen. I pushed my computer to the side. I wanted no distractions. I wanted to hear every goddamn thing they had to say. And, and you were I, not disappointed. I am so happy I did this. They made it worth my time. They were... You know they were? They were the Aussie Usos. The New Zealand Usos. The New Zealand, were, I apologize. They were clear, made clear they were going to the real land down under. That's New right. Zealand. They, they were New Zealand Usos. The, the exact Usos, yes. same kind of promos the Usos are doing now. Well, that makes the Usos sound awesome, then. Their new promos are awesome. Okay. One guy rants and raves, and the other guy throws in some words here and there. That is what happened. Yeah, it was so great, this promo. So they're going back to New Zealand, the real down under. It's, it's this festive time of year, they say, because Christmas is coming. They're going back to the real down under to bask in the praise and the glory and the awards of all the New Zealanders who had tears of pride running down their arms right now. They've been running all over the U.S. bloody A, from city to bloody city, state to bloody state, arena to bloody arena, like a hurra bloody cane. They called out the superpowers. They called out Hayes and Garvin. Called out the Rock and Roll Express. Lord knows who else. If I did zero justice to the Arn Anderson promo, I am doing negative justice to the Sheep Herders promo. It was so incredible. Everybody needs to watch this. You will you will weep when you compare it to the so promos awesome. that we see today in pro wrestling. Unbelievably great. And I'm not even saying WWE anywhere. Oh, anywhere. Nobody's doing promos as good. And it's not like these guys were main eventers. No, they're like third or fourth down the tag team wrong. And we rarely see them. And (laughs) if we do, it's a treat. Yes. Just awesome. Barbarian versus Larry Stevens. Ball bearing one with a diving headbutt. I was too busy recapping the Sheep Herders promo to say anything about this. There's nothing to say. One with a headbutt. Then we had Paul Jones, Warlord, and the Barbarian cutting a promo. You know, I will say, Paul Jones is not in the Hall of Awesome. I was thinking to myself, man, we could just... You know, put in two guys today. But Paul just dropped the fucking ball on this he was, show. He was not awesome on this he show. He fucking sucked on this show. And usually he sucks to the degree that he is, in fact, awesome. Yeah, not today. This is he's just a bad promo. And this was the better of the two. Uh, okay. Dude, uh. the second one was fucking horrendous. So, Jones talks about Warlord or Barbarian being the world's two strongest wrestlers. He has no sympathy for anyone who gets hurt in the stampede, but he does note in the stampede that both Ball Bearing and the Warlord are high in the stampede. And he did say Ball Baron. Every time. Every time. Yeah, he has to be doing it on purpose. Dude. He says, how would you like to get in the ring with them? No! <laughs> I just love how he, he did his entire promo, and then he just awkwardly walked away. 
That's what, that was this he, more awkward than the end of the show or less awkward? I think it was a little less. I think this moment. I think this moment was a little more awkward. Okay. Because yeah, I, I think I think when he leaves earlier, he does have like a final line. Sure. This was he just stops and leaves. Yeah. And I'm talking about uh, the very end of the show, where where. Uh, oh, we'll get to it. Yeah, Crockett's wrapping it up. Oh, oh, that. No, that was a hundred times more awkward. Okay. So I thought fine. you meant the more awkward Paul Jones moment. No, the second one was just worse. Mike Rotundo versus Italian Stallion. So Kevin Sullivan's out there doing commentary. He says, Nikita Koloff is now the world's only TV champion, but he looks flat today. Meanwhile, you take a man like Mike Rotunda, the Florida heavyweight champion, a stepping stone champion that leads many men to the world title. Look how great he looks. So this match went longer than it needed to. It was funny... Because obviously they've been, you know, doing this thing with Rotunda and Sullivan, and they did the angle where Rotunda was getting beat in a match, and Sullivan slapped him, and Rotunda fired up and whipped the guy's ass. It seemed to me that the fans liked Rotunda this entire match. Then he had a butterfly suplex and won, and then they all booed him. That's kind of weird. So Maybe they were booing because Sullivan showed up right then or something. Or they wanted the airplane spin. Could be. He didn't give it to him. Which, if that's the case, then great move on his part. I so, a story at WrestleMania where in the middle of the Nakamura match, all of a sudden, if you're watching on TV, there was a bunch of people cheering, but there was nothing happening in the match. What happened in the crowd? Somebody did an airplane spin? No, there were, there were three guys that were standing up in a section where everybody was sitting down. And the fans kept telling them to sit down. Ah, I see. They wouldn't sit down. Yeah. So they called security. Yeah. Security comes and tells the guys to sit down. They still won't sit down. So security goes and gets fucking cops <laughs> with guns. The cops show up and drag these three guys out because they won't sit down. How dare you enjoy yourselves on our wrestling show? And everybody starts chanting, you fucked up. They sing the goodbye song. I do remember that. They <laughs> sing, you deserve it. Yeah. It was that's all I could pay attention to. It well, was so awesome. The match was not worth paying attention to itself. So I was like, you flew all the fucking way. Yeah. To New Orleans. Uh -huh. You paid all this money for tickets, and you're getting your ass kicked out of this fucking show because you won't sit down versus Nakamura and AJ? The only three guys in the whole fucking section standing up? Yeah. <sighs> Amazing. So Sullivan starts putting Rotunda over. A varsity athlete. He lettered in wrestling at Syracuse. He lettered in football in Syracuse. Now he's, a, he's his own man. He doesn't need to listen to me. He doesn't need to listen to anyone else. He just needs to listen to himself. And he says all this, and Rotunda finally gets a chance to speak. He just says, when Kevin Sullivan says it, it's not bragging at all. And he smiles, and he leaves. And this this is actually... I didn't appreciate... I did not appreciate at the time how great this was. But this was Kevin Sullivan being the master manipulator. Yes. He has recruited Mike Rotunda by sucking up to him. But in the process, Rotunda is now his man. Yes. It was great. Okay, Larry's... You do all the thinking for yourself. You do all the thinking for yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking for you. No. That's what he keeps telling him, mm -hmm. even though he is. Even though he is. Larry Zabisco versus Tony Super. Was this not a fun match? It was pretty fun. Because... <laughs> I was like, this is a fun match. Larry Zabisco and Tony Super. Yes, because I was watching Tony Super and thinking, this guy's pretty big. This guy's pretty athletic. Larry's giving him a lot. He's green as all hell. <laughs> he's, he has no idea what the hell he's doing out there. But he's, he's, he's a talented guy. So I looked him up in wrestling. It appears that he was just a Crockett jobber for several years. Yeah, Larry just decided, let's go have a fun yeah. match. So I don't, I'm assuming this is the same guy. There is a Tony Suber, a football player, who was drafted by the Buffalo Bills in 1982. Never actually played in the league, but he went to uh, Gardner-Webb University in North Carolina. So I'm assuming this is the same guy. Probably. And he yeah. was still in you know, the first year or two in the business. Uh, they went back and forth the whole way with Larry being Larry Zabisco and Tony being this completely green, out of control, but scary guy. And then Larry won with a small package out of nowhere. Yeah. He, <laughs> he out-wrestled him and escaped by the skin of his teeth. Yes. <laughs> that was fun. I liked it. Ric Flair came out for a promo. Says oh, this. Man, we are so fucking old. Well, I know, but why? Well, he mentions the belt. The Crockett spent $40,000 on the belt, he said. Oh, yes, yes. Which probably costs more than the house you live in. Oh, that line. <laughs> I was yeah. like, forty fucking thousand dollars Holy shit. So, I need to move. I thought you were talking about 
when he said this nameplate, and he holds up the nameplate, Ric Flair, says, I'm going to put this on here for the fifth time. Well, that too. That also made me feel old. So he's done talking about himself for him, and he says he, he, he liked Lex Luger. He thought Lex was a great guy, a great athlete, had the best body in the business. He said, Lex, just because you couldn't make it as a horseman, that doesn't mean your career is over, but you need to choose your path very carefully. If you jump on Arn Anderson, then you're going to have to mess with Tully Blanchard. If you jump on Tully Blanchard, you have to mess with Arn Anderson. And if you jump on Tully and Arn, you'll have to mess with me. So he goes back to talking about himself. Says one of his claim, one of his claims to fame, besides thousands of women, was being the dirtiest player in the game. Says he drives nothing but the biggest limousines, makes love to nothing but the best looking women. Yes. He starts talking about Michael Hayes and warned him, "Don't be like, don't be like Lex Luger. Don't be a loser. Don't jump on the Nature Boy." Lex comes out for a promo after the break. I think I've made this comparison before, but Lex comes out dressed like the bad guy in every 1980s comedy of all time. Got the polo shirt with a popped collar sticking out of his pink cashmere sweater with the aviator sunglasses hanging from the collar. You know, this promo here, before we get into it, as you can see from watching the show last couple of weeks, Luger's the guy. Oh, God, he's the guy. He's the one they want to be the guy. They're going to phase out Ric Flair. Lex Luger's going to become the champion. He's younger than Hogan. He's better looking than Hogan. He's got a better body than Hogan. Yeah. Well, man, oh, man, this was not the show for this fucking guy to drop the ball. Like, this promo was okay, but it was not the promo from last week. It was, he seemed nervous. He seemed to... He had to stop and collect his thoughts several times. Yeah, and, and it wasn't it wasn't last week where the fans were giving him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Like, they gave him the benefit of the doubt last week. Now he's fucking it up again. Sting showed so much more charisma on the show tonight. Yeah. Like... Ten times the charisma of Lex Luger. So you can already see that this is their Roman Reigns. Kind of. He's like the guy they want, but he ain't the guy. Yes. Unfortunately, WWE does not have a sting right now. No. Or a flair. Or, frankly, they don't have a Lex. Man, or John Cena and Nikki Bella. Life's rough. So... Lex talks about learning intensity from Arn, learning wrestling from Tully, and learning how to be a champion from Flair. Says it was a two-way street. Many times he had to carry he had to carry them home after a rough night out. He was the one who had gone to Flair's house to train Flair for his rematch against Ronnie Garvin. Said he had always been a team player, always looked out for his fellow horsemen's feelings. Said, yes, it's true, I have no allies, but I have God-given ability and desire. And so Arn has stepped up like Arn always does, and he's promised to take me out. But he's not going to hide from Arn. He's going to meet him face to face and overcome Arn's intensity with his own. And he promised Arn would not stand in his way. I actually thought this was a pretty good promo, but there were many better on this particular show. Yeah, this was this was not top guy Lex was carrying not, the company promo. Certainly not the face of the company on this particular episode. Jimmy Garvin and Michael Hayes versus Gladiator number one and Gladiator number two. Christ, Michael Hayes in his promo at the end of the show had ten times the charisma of Luger. That is true. Ten times better interview. Yeah. Didn't have the body, although we saw more of his body. Well, speaking show. of Michael Hayes' body, uh, he has worn these tights before, and you've pointed out they're a little yes. too snug. Listen, I don't know if they shrunk or what, but I'm just going to say this bluntly and honestly as possible. Michael Hayes is wearing this tights, wearing these tights. I could not just see a bulge. I could see his penis and his two testicles through these tights. It was anatomically correct wrestling wear. Unacceptable. It was anatomically correct wrestling wear? Yes. Like there was a pouch for it to go into? Apparently. I'm disgusted with you. I'm disgusted with Michael Hayes' dick. Well, I was too. I don't know why you had to have that thing flopping around uh, out there. Yeah, you could, you, could, you could see motion. Yeah, it's just not... Is that what the women were looking for? He dresses to the left. So, on top of all that, I believe the gladiators are better pro wrestlers than Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin. I did check. <laughs> so... Uh, Hayes won with a bulldog. I have nothing else to say. Hey, these gladiators are pretty good. The gladiators are better wrestlers. One of them like, apparently was George South. Well, who knows who they were on any particular day. That's but, actually true. I mean, they were good. Yeah. Ricky Morton and Sting versus Curtis Thompson and John Savage. Holy fuck, what a match. 
<laughs> Ricky Morton is out there being totally fucking awesome. Yes. Sting is out there being totally fucking terrible. Just out of control. <laughs> he's just flying around. He's all crazy. So I'm looking at first first thing I noticed is that the best physique in the, the best physique in this match was Curtis Thompson, and the second best might have been John Savage. These are two big muscular men. Curtis is just huge. And in fact, he would later go on to gain, I guess you'd have to say fame, stretching it a bit, but he was Firebreaker Chip. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. So there was a spot where Sting and Savage. I, I, I can't remember oh, that. Who, I don't know who was slamming who. Sting had an arm bar, and the spot is. And so Savage was going to slam. Savage will slam him, okay. but Sting will hang yeah, on. All you have to do is over. hold on. Yeah. Boy, did they fuck this thing up. It was not. Good. I, I can't even explain what happened. But if you know the spot, just hold on. Yeah. It didn't That's, happen here. Gravity will do the spot for you. No, he if you went, just hold on. Somebody went like upside down and backwards. He ended up flipped like the, around the wrong side of staying. Sting had to pull him over. I'm not sure. Well, that, okay, that was the worst Sting moment of the match. There was another one that may have been a bigger fuck up, but it, it worked out better. Talk about the high cross. Ricky whips Thompson into the ropes and does a drop down. Yes, and Thompson has to jump over Ricky, and Sting's waiting for him. The rock and rolls do this all the time, and usually the other guy hits a drop kick or a hip toss or a back elbow or something basic. Sting does a high cross. It was like it was a shoot. <laughs> yes, he, he had to save someone's life. I'm going to hit you with every part of my body at the same time. <laughs> like only one of them could survive this high cross. He was going to make sure he was a survivor, and Thompson died. He hit him so goddamn hard. And Thompson, as mentioned, is a big, big dude. And Sting hits him like a goddamn freight train. Feet go flying everywhere. They <laughs> both collapse on the mat. It was spectacular. And it wasn't even dead on. It was like he hit him mostly with his thighs. <laughs> it was just so wacky. So they get through this match. Sting beats Thompson with a stinger splash and the scorpion. Yeah. Wow. It, it was fun. Oh, it was fun. It was not good, No, but it was fun. Jim Crockett comes out. Oh, God. He says he is there to discuss Dusty Rhodes' future, and all he really has to say is that Dusty and Nikita will challenge the Midnight Express for the U.S. tag titles next week on TV, and hopefully then Dusty will announce his plans. So he's already the U.S. champion. Yeah. Now you're giving him a chance to win another title and possibly retire with both belts? Yes, all three belts. This is poor planning. Basically. You are a bad booker. Road Warriors versus Thunderfoot number one and Thunderfoot number two. A complete squash. The Warriors won with the Gravedigger, which is one of the Midnight Express's finishers, a point none of the announcers noticed. So Animal cuts a promo. He says people have been telling them, telling them to shed this or cut that, but they just want to keep adding mass. <laughs> okay. It's the 80s, baby. I guess it was. So Hawk, it's his turn to talk, and he talks about how crazy they are. He says the elevator doesn't go all the way to the all the way to the top because there is no elevator. Then he says we snack on danger, we dine on death. Goodbye, goodbye. Like the Brian and Vinny show has ended, and I am saying goodbye and I leave. Yeah. So Hawk and Animal did here. He said goodbye and they leave. So Paul Ellering is out there. He's running his mouth about whatever. When Paul Jones reappears, dude, he was a bumbling numbskull in this promo. What's well, Paul Jones? So they're clearly setting up a strength contest. Yes. Which team is stronger? All you have to fucking do is say, let's have a bench press contest. This fucking idiot is out here saying, he goes, my men will challenge your men to any contest in the wrestling ring. Then he realizes, no. You can't do that one. So he says, no. <laughs> How about a bodybuilding contest? Or a jogging contest. Jogging! I'm like, well, for, listen, Vinny. Jogging's stupid, but a fucking bodybuilding contest? He didn't even say weightlifting. He, did, so he I, said bodybuilding. Eventually, he said weightlifting. So you're going to prove you're stronger by standing there and flexing? What the hell difference does that <laughs> well, make? How do you prove you're stronger by jogging? Well, that's stupid, too. They're both stupid. He then said running, which is more athletic. He, I actually want to see the Road Warriors versus the Powers of Pain in a jogging contest. They'd, it'd probably be a tie. <laughs> so finally, Paul Ellering just accepts a bench press contest because he's not a moron. <laughs> so you're missing over a lot of this. First of all, Joan says he, he, he half apologizes for interrupting Ellering's time. Says he's not there to pick a fight. He just has something he has to get off his chest. He says 
Paul, you may have been joking when you said the Warriors were the two strongest wrestlers in the world. Maybe they said it. That doesn't matter. But we do need to clear things up. We need to prove that the Warlord and Barbarian are strongest. Because Ellering has to prove this, too. Here was where he challenged him. I still can't believe this. He challenged him to jogging. <laughs> Running, but not as fast as you can. Like at three-quarter speed. Crockett is blatantly cracking up. <laughs> Just laughing his ass off. Ellering is trying to hide it by burying his face in his hands, but he's also laughing his ass off at this idiot. So, finally, Jones says that we need to prove who's strongest, and I had to come out here and do it publicly so you couldn't deny that I have issued this challenge. He leaves. So at least he had a point there. Ellering calls Jones. He said, first he says, I think I hear a faucet running. Wait, that's not a faucet. That's just a drip. Everybody howled <laughs> with laughter at this Man, insult. There was no Twitter in the 80s. Comedy was easier. So he calls Jones a dog chasing a car, but what happens when the car stops? He says his men can bench press 600 pounds. And Jones had challenged him to come up with $50,000. Ellering said he'd have no problem getting that money together. He's Mr. Wall Street. Mr. Wall Street. And he leaves. <laughs> Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard versus Denny Brown and Kendall Wyndham. So they have done some stuff with Denny. Some stuff. They've done, dumb, done some stuff with Kendall. And the announcers are talking about how it's going to be a great match, and Arn wins in two minutes with the Gord Buster. Maybe two minutes. It was like a minute. Yeah. So then the horsemen all come out for a promo. First thing they do is they all smile and show up these big, shiny gold belts. Awesome. Flair calls Hayes a nothing happening street trash spandex cowboy. <laughs> Has no business being a world champion. So finally, Hayes comes out. Thank God he's in street clothes. I was going to say, thank God he's in clothes. I, he's, he's, yes. He is appalled. He says, Flair, you can run down everyone in the locker room. You could run down me, but I am not going to stand by and let you run down the good people of Atlanta, Georgia. He starts to go off about how Flair has no idea what it's like to grow up poor, no idea what it's like to have the whole family sleeping in the same bed. And finally, the horsemen are bored, and they start beating the fuck out of him. Uh, so it's a three-way attack, but the Garvins run in to make the save. And they flee, and then it's Michael Hayes' time to cut a promo. And Michael Hayes, when he's dressed decently... <laughs> and got a fire under him. Cuts a hell of a promo. God damn, it was an awesome promo. Fans are going nuts chanting his name. Mm -hmm. He says, first they, they challenged the horseman to a six man, which seemed obvious. And I thought maybe they're going to do that for next week. Because they, they seem to load up the end of the year shows on this, this program. But he says, he's taking Flair to a time limit draw. And he's 28 years old, already been in this business 11 years. He's just getting better. And he's full of, full of fires. You know, incredibly charismatic. Everyone loves him. Everyone thinks... This is the guy who can beat Ric Flair. And he finishes, and they leave. And suddenly, poor, innocent, naive David Crockett is left alone with a microphone and a camera, and he's got to try to fill time. You've never seen TV more awkward. You've never... Is he, it that hard? To, just to talk... To read. fill up a little bit of time... Hey, fans, we're here every Saturday at 6.05. That was a great... We got a lot of big stuff coming up, including our first ever pay-per-view, the Bunkhouse Stampede, mm -hmm. actually on pay-per-view for once. Yep. The end of the year's coming up. We owe people a lot of money. He's got nothing gonna to say. We're going to sell next year to Ted Turner. He's got nothing to say. Finally, Tony comes in to help him, Tony being a professional television personality, smoothly, simply just drops in like two sentences about what a great show it's been and how great, it's ha how great it is to have everyone there. And David, resp David responds, Listen, Tony. That's great. We'll see you next week. <laughs> so horrible. Lovably horrible. He is lovably horrible. This show was a lot of fun. Yeah, our buddy Lance, who was on the show a couple of weeks ago, he waited months and months and months and months and months to uh, review that one show that he was on. Mm -hmm. Buyer's remorse, he said this week. Buyer's remorse. This was an awesome show. This was a great show. This was a great show. Check it out, everybody. Enjoy it while you can, because things are things are fixing to change. For those of you that don't know, Crockett was about to find himself belly up. Eh. They signed these guys to these deals where they would make, say, $300,000 a year, but they wouldn't be paid you know, 300 divided by 52 per week. They would be paid for the shows that they did. But then, at the end of the year, 
if they hadn't been paid their full ah, 300, I see. they had to make it up. So he owed, every, he owed all the wrestlers money. So he had a massive amount of money and that he had to pay at the end. So December, it's happening right now. And it didn't occur to him in the prior 12 months to set some money aside. Well, they figured that Starcade would be huge. I see. And then WWE killed Starcade by running Survivor Series. Uh-huh. So they were well, fucked. I mean, the Clash is coming. Clash is coming. We, we're, the, they we're four months in the first Clash of James. The Ding Dongs are coming a few years from now. That, that's Think, also, things will be all right. That's also true. Yeah. Well, we, we, well, it'll probably be six months by the time we get to it, but we're going to have to watch that first Clash. Dude, we're going to have to watch a lot of stuff. Yeah. We ain't quitting until the end. They put up all the WCW Saturday they nights. They did, yeah. It goes for years now. Yeah, we'll go all the way till we get to Thunder. And then... Who knows? <laughs> Vinny's out of here. All right, everybody. That is it for today. I want to thank you all for listening. Oh, like Art Bell. That's right. You're going to be mine all night long. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Well, let's get going here. This is all happier Before subject. Before I fall asleep. So we watched NWA World Championship Wrestling. December 26, 1987. The last show of 1987. The show wasn't that bad. Main event was. It was well. The final match on the show was, but we got a real tag team championship match with wrestlers. It was okay. We'll, yeah, it's pretty good. We'll get to it. I enjoyed it. So they replayed last week's confrontation between Michael Hayes and Ric Flair, and then they were in a, in an arena this week, the Dorn Arena in Raleigh, North Carolina. They're trying to tape more on the road to spice up the shows. Yeah, which is funny. They're usually less interesting that way. Well, because you got a small building with. If you got a small building and the fans don't care, it sucks. Yes. If you got a small building and the fans are going crazy, it's better than a larger arena. Of course. Where the fans are kind of just sitting there. It's, a, it's better better ambiance. Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross on commentary. David Crockett there to do interviews. And our opener, Ronnie Garvin and the Mighty Wilbur. Yeah, what's wrong with that? There's this Chance of Quaid and Tommy Angel. I know we've talked about how Ronnie Garvin's title run wasn't the greatest, but seriously, it's been like a month. He was the heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah. Now he is teaming with Mighty Wilbur. Yeah. Okay. I had no problem with it. I mean, he's talking about being back in the title picture. He's not going to be, but... Yeah, he, he threw Flair's name out there in a desperate attempt to keep himself relevant. Here's what I know about this. We had Jim Cornette on the show on Thursday. I was talking to him about jobbers. Mm-hmm. And he threw out a line about how Garvin would go in there and just stretch guys. Yeah. He'd sugar them. I watched Ronnie Garvin, and he's such a realistic grappler. And he does stretch the shit out of these jobbers. He's a guy with no wrestling or shooting background to speak of. Mm-hmm. Well, if you look at most of the holds he does, most of them, it's clear he's making them up on the spot. For example... Well, sure, and the jobbers are letting him do stuff. Also also true. But he makes, it, he makes me believe. I see. Yeah. yeah. He did a hold where he had like a schoolboy. We've all seen a schoolboy. The, 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 you get behind the guy, stick your arm between his legs, roll him up, and go for a pin. So Garvin would do this move, and the ref would count one, and the ref would count two, and then Garvin would stand up and hook that leg with his one arm and just stand there and pull it up. A stretch muffler. That wasn't even that. <laughs> it was an old school stretch muffler. He was hugging his thigh and pulling up on it. I've seen better moves. And the guy would scream and cry and it would work. Sure. It a very weird move. All of uh, Wilbur's offense was shoulder blocks and avalanches. Sure. Can't fuck it up. But you know, he's a friendly guy. He shook hands with the jobbers. He did. He did. He was very pleasant to work with. I'm sure they just cringed every time he made a tag. It's funny. If you work with Ronnie Garvin, he will beat you up, but he won't hurt you. Yes. (laughs) With Wilbur, it's a toss-up. I'm not sure which guy I'd rather work with. Well, you know, I don't think he hurt anybody. I don't think you know. he did squish this guy with a splash here for the finish. Yeah, Garvin punched both guys, and Wilbur pinned. Oh, let's see. Uh, Who cares? He pinned a guy with a splash. That's he, the least of our worries. He gave a big thumbs up to the camera, and they did a promo. Well, before we get to the promo, two things. Remember on this show later, there's footage of the Christmas night bunkhouse stampede. Yes. Okay. I don't know when this match was taped, but in that match, Mighty Wilbur broke his leg. Oh, really? So this must have been taped prior yeah. to the stampede, the I'm footage sure of which they live. put on this show. It yeah. wasn't live, yeah. but... The other thing is, already WWE was going after Big Bubba. Yes. Now, the Big Boss Man ended up very good, but, like, the Big Bubba we've seen, not very good. Right. Would you say he's better or worse than the Mighty Wilbur? I'd say it's a toss-up. He's had... Hmm, that's actually a fair question. Wilbur's a better promo for... Well, you haven't seen Bubba talk one bit. 
Yeah, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Uh, you know what? We hadn't seen... I, I, I haven't seen, like, Bubba's... Bubba had already been UWF champion by this point. Sure. So he had a, he had a better... Doesn't mean a lot. He, he had a more... A fuller resume than we've seen. Sure. We've seen him do some shitty squash matches. My point is, why weren't they interested in Wilbur? I don't know. He's a very charismatic guy. It's not big like, guy. It's not like Vince McMahon hasn't had an obsession with hillbillies over the years. Yeah. You know, just throwing him in with the gym and... I think maybe they wanted, they wanted a big, mean heel... Mm. And Bubba was a heel, and Mighty Wilbur is, is much better served as a nice, friendly... We were still in the peak of Hulkamania. Yes. Looking for big, scary guys to work with the Hulkster. And Bubba did rise to the occasion. Oh, he did. Sign. He did, that's for sure. So Garvin says that... Uh, <laughs> Garvin's all fired up. This country boy has earned my respect. This country boy can survive, he says. And he's sure to, he's sure to mention he's still uh, pursuing Ric Flair, but he challenges any team to come face them. And then... So, uh, Crockett turns to interview Wilbur, my the favorite baby, nicest face character, friendliest, in all of NWA, the most humble wrestler there's ever been. It's an honor to be teaming with a Mister Garvin. He's a well, he's a future world champion and a former world champion. And I was so excited when I learned I'd be teaming with Mister Garvin. I had to call my friends back in Hayward. And my phone back in Hayward is like a the whole directory called me, and he's going on. And Shivani, or I don't know, Shivani Crockett, is trying to give him cues to wrap it up and trying to pull the mic away and trying to tell him to get to the point, and Wilbur's having none of it. He can't stop talking about what an honor it is to team with Mr. Garvin. And finally, Garvin knows what's going on. He pulls the mic away, and he fires up some snappy line. I'll say it again. Any team that wants to face us, just sign the dotted line. And he walks away. It should be a clear sign to wrap things up. But Wilbur grabs the mic back and says, the four horsemen. Yeah. And Crockett laughs and they go to commercial. Cool. We need more guys like the Mighty Wilbur. That's a very fair statement. We need a Mighty Wilbur in wrestling today. Mighty Wilbur on, on Monday Night Raw today would make things much more fun. Yep. That's Ain't no fact. Garvin was working somewhat heelish in this match. Aggressive eh, wrestling, back rakes. He always did back rakes. He He's was, turning. Dude, his finish was a stomp. A series of stomps to the head. This guy's turning, Vinny. Well, he is. But He's going to screw Mighty Wilbur. He wrestled the same way here as he did in his own entire But it was different. No, it was the same. No, I felt it was same different. Same means not different. I felt it was different. Even the announcers brought up he's being very aggressive tonight. I see. Road Warriors versus Bob Emery and Trent Knight. So the Road Warriors music hits. They run down to the ring. They attack. Animal starts throwing the clubbing forearms to the chest, forgetting that he was wearing a leather bracer with spikes on it. Oops. I'm sure there were fake spikes. I'm sure it still sucked. They won in a minute with a doomsday device. David Crockett interviewed Lex Luger. Boring. His mullet, however. Well, he had a nice mullet, was but... wonderful. I mean, seriously, this guy had, like, his greatest interview of all time, like, a month ago. The one where he first turned? He, he can't cut a promo to save his life now. What's going on? It's boring, and he rambled, and he mumbled, said Tully and Arn tried to take him out of wrestling. He believed they were a family. Arn's going to learn what the total package is all about. Now, imagine stretching that out over, like, three minutes. That was not perfect. I can't. Larry Zabisco versus Ricky Nelson. You know, I can see that people are bored shitless by Larry sometimes, but he's actually a very good, very smart worker. Mm -hmm. But it is boring. It is. He had, a, he had a very good, boring match. Yeah, if you put Larry on early in the show where you're not bored yet, mm -hmm. I could be entertained by him. If this would have been late in the show, I'd have wanted to kill somebody. Yes, that's yeah. a good way to put it. Everything he does look good. looks good. He went oh, may I please talk about the finish? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, I just, I just, no, I, must, I won't let you. I, I, it doesn't matter what else you're saying. This is the most. This is the key thing in this match. Okay, it's Larry Zabisco. He's beating this poor little fool, Ricky Nelson. Ricky Nelson, yes. He fucking puts the guy like on his knees or his butt or whatever, and he goes by him and he grabs his arms and he starts stretching his arms back like this. He's just holding him here, okay? A, a rest hold. Sure. Okay? So a rest hold is designed so that the guy gets a little bit of rest so that he can fire up for his comeback. Okay. So Larry's got this guy stretched out like this for like two minutes. And I'm thinking, he's going to give Ricky Nelson a comeback here? <laughs> he stretches him, he stretches him, he stretches him, and then he lets go, and he gives him a neckbreaker 
and he pins him. Yes. It's like, you wasted two minutes of my fucking life on a rest hold so that you could then do a neck breaker. <laughs> That's what you know what I mean? Yeah. Why? Because he's Larry Zabisco. To make me mad? Yes. After I'm here putting him over? He does that bullshit? Yeah, this went twice as long as it needed to. I've never seen a rest hold to set up a guy's finishing move. I don't think in my whole life I've ever seen that. It was pretty amazing. Dude, I couldn't believe my eyes. For those of you keeping track of the Spam Slam of the Week, this week it goes to Michael Hayes for his vertical suplex. No one is keeping track of this, Vinny. Someone somewhere. No. Somewhere vast. This is, this is not like you're going over the finishes at the end of the Ron Knight report. No. Nobody cares about the spam slam of the Someone week. Someone at home has a notebook. No, not they're even marking, Mookie. They're marking it by pen in ink. Spam slam of the week. Show combatant move. Bullshit. Michael Hayes, vertical suplex. <laughs> okay. It's time for the Bunkhouse Stampede Finals. Now think about it. First, I'm going to not do this in the order they announced it. What? Where are we? We just skipped the spam slam of the week. Is this before Sting and Mark Fleming? Yes. How did I not write anything about this? Well, fortunately, I wrote the whole thing down. Okay. Okay. So, hmm. these men have already qualified for the Bunkhouse Stampede Finals. Big Bubba, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, Warlord, Barbarian, Ivan Koloff, Dr. Death, Mighty Wilbur, Lex Luger, and Animal. That's so, does that mean that all those people won a Bunkhouse Stampede? At least one. Oh, my God. Well, they're doing this Can different- you go over the list again? All right. Let's just imagine our heads, each of these individuals winning mm-hmm. a bunkhouse stampede. Big Bubba, <laughs> Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, The Warlord. The Warlord. The Warlord. The Warlord. The Ball Bearing. The Warlord had a match two years ago on television that was fucking horrific. We've <laughs> never seen him on TV since. Pretty much. You can only imagine. The Ball Bearing, Ivan Koloff, Dr. Death. Mighty Wilbur. Mighty Wilbur. At least he's big. Lex Luger, an animal. Now, for those of you who are keeping track of the Spam Slam of the Week and also wrote down all ten of those names, yes, that's ten men. That seems like a good number of men to have in the finals of the Bunkhouse Stampede. So they're going to do a wild card match to name an eleventh finalist. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Why the hell not? The only thing I can think is... Because one guy's going to eliminate ten. The only Because there's eleven guys the in The only thing I can think is... They booked the finals, they had all ten men, and then somebody realized, wait, we forgot to put Dusty in there. Oh, come on. Because they are doing a five-man steel cage battle royal, with the winner going into the 11-man steel cage battle royal. Excuse me, excuse me. A steel cage battle royal? Yes. What the fuck is a steel cage battle royal? You throw them over the top of the cage? Or through the door. No. Yeah, they did this three years in a row. And this year they're doing two. Well, now I know why they went out of business. (laughs) Yes. It's a really stupid a idea. fucking steel cage battle royal. Were you out to launch this entire promo? I, I must have been, because <laughs> yeah. I went from I went from the Larry Z match to Sting and Mark Fleming. Okay. Where was I? I don't know. This went on for a long time. So the five-man steel cage battle royal, to determine who will be the 11th man in the other steel cage battle royal. Did I go get the cookies? You may have. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, Nikita Koloff, Bobby Eaton, Dick Murdoch. Dick Murdoch? Dick Murdoch. That's not the most shocking part. Black Bart. When was well, the last was time we saw Black Bart? More recently than we saw the Warlord. I don't who think Who won true. a bunkhouse. I'm, I guarantee it. In a, in a match? Yeah, we've seen Warlord team with Ivan Koloff and stuff. Uh, maybe. At least at least in promos. Yeah, I there. guess so, yeah. I, I don't think Black Bart's been on TV in 1987. No, he has. Because remember he was that weird champion? That was, like, that was at least a year ago. Uh, fucking He's like feuding with... Who cares? Uh, not Kendall Wynn. I'm shooting with somebody lame. Oh, it's Scott Casey. No, no, no. Um, Sam Houston. Was, Fuck, that made a mark on me. I think that's right. Anyway, the last guy is Dusty Rhodes, who, of course, is going to win. Sting versus Mark Fleming. This was awesome. Has there ever been a more fun, bad wrestler than Sting? <laughs> Never. Young Sting? Never. He was so... This was the wrestling version of his promos. Yes. Completely wild and out of control. <laughs> yes. A little horrifying. He did the most awkward high cross I've ever seen in my entire life. It's the, it's the classic baby face spot. You get whipped into the corner, you jump, you land on the ropes, facing out of the ring, and you do the twisting reverse high cross. Yeah. And he, I'm not sure which part of his body hit Mark Fleming. Was it Mark Fleming? Yes. Yes, Mark Fleming. Completely out of control. Then he did my new favorite sting <laughs> spot of all time. <laughs> so I can't believe he stopped doing this. So imagine his opponent is on his back, yes. and Sting is standing next to him. Sure. He leaps in the air and does a big splash. Right. 
Then he gets up and quickly hops to the other side of the guy and does another big splash. From the other side. Then he jumps up and hops to the other side and does another big splash. He did like three of these in a row. Four. I did four. I counted four. He what did. was the best, that? Here's the best part. <laughs> he jumps, does a splash, jumps to the other side, does a splash, jumps to the other side, does a splash, jumps to the other side, does a splash, then he doesn't make a cover. He's on his, he's on his, like, kneeling with his hands on his hips, and he turns to the ref and says, ask him! Yeah. And Earl Hebner looks at Sting, shrugs, he asks Mark Fleming, do you want to submit? Mark Fleming just says no, and Earl says, he's not submitting. So, as wacky as this was, it worked. It did work. The fans laughed at this wacky series of twisting splashes. It was so goofy. And you know what? We used to watch Magnum. And Magnum would come on TV, and he would win with his belly-to-belly in two seconds. Mm-hmm. And then, like the Road Warriors, they win with their clothesline in two seconds. We had Magnum on the show, and I asked him, why were your matches always so short on TV? Like a fucking idiot. What a stupid question. He goes, well, the idea was the fans would pay to see my long matches. Aha. Okay? Not the case with Sting. All I can think is Dusty thought his matches were so fucking hilarious that he was like, go out there for five minutes with this jobber. I'm just going to laugh my ass off in the back watching this spectacle. He did not need to go five minutes. No. He needed to come out and do one stinger splash and get the fuck out of there. And yet I needed to see him go five minutes. Yeah, they let him. So after doing the four twisting splashes and ask him, like I said, it worked. It got a pop. The crowd loved it. And so Sting looked at them cheering, and you can see the wheels turning in his head, and he said, I'm going to do it again. (laughs) And he did more twisting splashes. Dude. Like he's spamming this move. And then he did a long neck crank, and he hit the stinger splash and the scorpion deathlock and won. Enjoyed. This was fun. Yes. David Crockett interviewed the superpowers. So they did the angle with uh, Dusty Rhodes' career allegedly being on the line at Starcade. He won to save his career. Then he cut a promo saying he might retire. He comes in here and says, I'm not retiring. Yeah, remember, wasn't it last week where they said next week we're going to have a very important interview with I, Dusty and we'll find out the future of his... They, 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 were, they were plugging it up like he was going to retire. It's been a while. He vowed not to retire. He was not going to leave Nikita Cole offside. He was going to fight beside him, called out a bunch of heels, dare them to come take his U.S. title, and he plugged the uh, plugged the U.S. tag team title later tonight and also the wild card match, acknowledging it could, could come down to himself versus Nikita. And Nikita agreed with that, and then he called out Mike Rotundo and Kevin Sullivan... And he plucked the U.S. tag title match, and that was it. Dusty was a hell of a promo. The key promos just get worse and worse. I just can't understand a word he says. No, yeah, you're not wrong. And I used to be able to. Like, the idea is he's been here for many years. His English is getting better. Not yeah. worse. Yeah. Steve Williams versus Curtis Thompson. Favorite part of this match is Williams is going for, like, a surfboard or... He's doing a bow and arrow. He's a bow and to, arrow, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's trying this bow and arrow, and it gets fucked up. I presume because of Thompson. And so when it's fucked up, Williams does not try to fix it. He's just like, okay. And he lets go. He stands up. And he lifts up Curtis Thompson. And he fucking Germans him right on his head. Yes, he did. I'm just thinking, don't fuck that up next time, dude. You were way better off in that bow and arrow. Yes. So he pressed Curtis Thompson over his head. And Curtis Thompson's a big motherfucker. And he suplexed him left and suplexed him right. You didn't see these very often in 1987 TV. Did a, uh, the, the, the press them into a Samoan drop. And then after all these giant power moves, he's the biggest, scariest guy in the roster. Thompson's like on his knees. And Doc says, I'm going to do a flying head scissors to this guy on his knees. Like he's amazing red or something. It did not go well. No. And Doc won with the Oklahoma Stampede. So for reasons I don't understand, Dr. Death is still the UWF champion, even though that promotion is now dead. And for reasons I really don't understand, Barry Windham is still the Western States Heritage Champion, even though it's a secondary title to a promotion that is now dead. So Barry is out here. I believe his intent was to challenge Dr. Death Steve Williams to a match. I know you didn't like this. I did not. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good, serious, sports-style promo in which he offered to take Steve Williams to the limit if they ever face off in an athletic contest for a championship belt. I haven't seen a promo like this in years. I so believe I'll he take said, it. I'm going to take you to the limit and then beat you. Sure. <laughs> I don't know. He was starting sentences, not finishing them. He was jumping from one phrase to the next without ever making a point. He said, fossil or not, Steve Williams was not a fossil. 
That's a quote. He wanted that UWF belt. No, Brian, I did not think this was a good promo. Oh, Vinny, get I thought out this of was here. a bad promo. Crockett interviews Ricky Morton. Oh, man. So the rock and rolls are leaving here pretty they're, soon. They're, they're running out, and they're, they're kind of make sporadic appearances God, in 1988. Damn it. They were fixing the feud with the sheep herders. He called out the sheep herders. Can you imagine? Those would be great matches. Oh, depressing. So he's running down these, these jerks who keep coming down to the ring from New Zealand and waving that British flag. And I thought, wait, what? And then a few seconds went by, and he repeated it. He won't stand for that British flag being waved by these New, Zealand, New Zealanders. So geography, not Ricky Morton's strong suit. He said rock and roll would explode like dynamite. He says he vows to win the titles for the fifth time. Aren't the Road Warriors the champions? No, the Road Warriors are the international team. I team. see. Tully okay. and R are the tag uh, That's right, that's yeah. right. He said too many teams try to make a name off of them to their detriment. The rock and rolls are going to explode like dynamite. This is a much better promo than Barry Windham's, aside from the geography. It was, but it was a little wacky. Of course it's wacky. The rock and rolls are going to explode like dynamite. Okay, no, no human being would actually say that out loud. He almost pulled it off. <laughs> no almost. One, no one else could have pulled it off any better. No. Could explode like dynamite. Woo! Woo! Eddie Gilbert versus George South. So, Eddie's... Where was wh- Robert? Oh, he's hurt. Well, okay then. Answer your question. Let's think about that for a second. Mm-hmm. Robert was so hurt he couldn't stand there and do nothing. Maybe he just didn't want to bother to drive out there. Maybe he knew their 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 uh, deal was coming up and was just not, not going to bother. <laughs> Man, Eddie Gilbert versus George South. Eddie is working the arm, screaming at the announcers. He wants Flair. He wants Dusty. He wants Nikita. Essentially, anyone with a title that is not from the UWF, which is dead. Hmm. And South makes a bit of a comeback. Eddie hits the hot shot and wins. Gilbert was awesome. George South deserved better. Fun match. That was fine. I give it a thumb up. <laughs> Crockett interviews the Road Warriors. Oh, my God. This May was I? so awesome. I wrote this all down. Okay. So, first off, Animal's doing this promo. He's actually talking about the bunkhouse stampede. Because he won one. Yeah, he's in the finals. Yeah, he's in the finals. Yeah. Then they go to Hawk. Hawk just starts ranting about how this is our interview time. We have bought and paid for this interview time. But let me tell you something. It was a big money contract. Therefore, because we have bought and paid for this interview time, I'm going to say whatever I want to say. He pauses. David Crockett. And this is profound because David Crockett never challenges anybody. But he turns to Hawk and he says... What are you trying to say? And Hawk pauses, and he says, Nothing! Tell him, Paul! Paul, who is a good talker, I swear to God, when, when he says, Tell him, Paul, Paul is dead silent. Deer in the headlights? And then he goes, Uh... Like, he literally said, Uh... <laughs> and then... <laughs> He just starts cutting a random promo about how the Road Warriors are the kings of the mountain. Yeah. What in the fuck was this? <laughs> I believe. Well, this was. I have never in my life, I have never heard David Crockett question one of these guys. <laughs> and I've heard some, some good, some great, and some fucking terrible promos. This was the first time that a guy just starts fucking rambling and David has no idea what his fucking point is. And there must have been one. Otherwise, David wouldn't have asked. I believe his point... Well, the setup here was Animal had the uh, the Bunkhouse Stampede finals to plug. Hawk, at this point, has nothing going on. Nothing! Zero. So he can go out, he can cut another generic Hawk promo, he can he can call out Barbarian or Warlord, you're not the world's strongest tag team. He can call out the Horsemen. Which he should have, because they're a month away from the bench press contest. It's coming up. But in the immediate short-term future, he's got nothing going on. So I think... I, I think what happened here was Hawk probably got Crockett in on it, but this whole thing was a setup to be a rib on Paul. Well, and then they put fucking it pulled it off all right. It was a rib on Paul. Jesus. A rib on you, a rib on me. Yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing like a rib that makes a guy look like a fucking idiot. But it was funny. I laughed. I laughed too. But at the end of the day, I didn't laugh at Paul. I laughed at Hawk. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? He's just being wacky. 
Hawk was very wacky. <laughs> Nothing. Tell him, Paul. Tell him, Paul. <laughs> That's his setup. That was tremendous. Paul couldn't even have been listening, because he couldn't even follow up. Like, the, the, well, you know, I did buy this airtime. If Paul knew this was co- coming, that he's the best actor in the world. He's not. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure he was. there was a rib on him. Michael P.S. Hayes beat Larry Stevens in fi- with the Bulldog in 15 seconds. He is challenging Ric Flair for the world title. He needs credibility. He's wearing black spandex this week, so his cock was invisible I'm as usual. I'm a big fan of these black tights. I'm sick of it. Because I can't see his Johnson. What's a P.S. stand for? Purely sexy. I'm thinking of something better that involves his penis his size. trousers. What's the S? Penis size. Oh, I see. I'm trying to think what it... Penis see-through? Penis sight? Hmm. Hmm. I have to think about this for a while. I don't want to think about this anymore. <laughs> thought about this too much already. The announcer said they had a very dangerous tag team match coming up. What's a word for a cut that starts with an S? Slice? Penis sliced? I don't know. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> anyway. Dude. <laughs> it was patently obvious last week with his trousers oh, it that he was. was wearing. I remember. They're, they're, they're burning Cut. in my mind. <laughs> We've broken the producers. Oh, God. The announcer said... It was a very dangerous tag team match. Com- tag team match. Excuse me? Tag team match. Did you say what I think he said? I thought it was a tag team much. What do you think okay. I said? It doesn't matter. All right. We're already off the rails. <laughs> no one's listening anymore. A very dangerous tag team match coming up at the Omni on January 1st. Yes. Now, keep in mind, this show we're reviewing aired on December 26th. Yeah, I got to sell them tickets. Yes. So, the Eclipse... From the Omni on the 25th, Christmas Day. Mm-hmm. Now, I knew I knew factually that Christmas Day used to be a big day in the wrestling calendar. Yeah. And everyone wanted to go see, see wrestling that day. Still, imagining Christmas afternoon going out to the Omni to watch pro wrestling, that's bizarre now. No, the kids would wake up in the morning, they would open their presents. Mm-hmm. One of their presents in the stocking would be clips of the wrestling that night. Yeah, so. You'd have your Christmas breakfast or whatever, brunch, and then you'd go to the wrestling show. Sounds like an awesome day to me. Could be worse. So it's a Christmas Day bunkhouse stampede. And what better match? <laughs> There's no better match for the spirit of Christmas than men in street clothes pummeling each other. So it comes down to Tully and Lex. And Lex gets him up in the torture rack. Arn hits the ring and attacks, but Lex is still able to dump Tully out and win. Actually, it was all Arn's fault. Even better. Arn attacked him and it's Tully even better, yeah. fell off the rack and bumped outside. Yes. So Arn and Tully and JJ, they all attack Lex after the match. <laughs> Tully goes up top. I am not making this move up, okay? Lex is flat on his back in the middle of the ring, okay? Flat on his back in the middle of the ring. Arn's got his feet. Arn has his JJ's feet. JJ's got his hands. Yep. Tully goes up to the top rope. He climbs to the top rope. He jumps off and does a double sledge right to the balls. Yes. Okay? It... Like, sometimes we say something, and it's not quite as ridiculous as we described it. Yeah. This is just as fucking goofy as it sounds. He did a double sledge to the balls off the top rope. To a man laying on his back. Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> so the place is going crazy. The horsemen are Yeah, here they trying bought to, that. Try, they're trying to mutilate Lex Luger, and who should make the save but Ole fucking Anderson. These women wanted to make babies with Lex, and this motherfucker came off the top with a double sledge to his balls. That's what happened. This is heat. So Ole makes a save. There's this huge brawl. That... Ole! Yeah. I still cannot get over babyface Ole Anderson. It is wacky. It it's is impossible. Wacky. They brawl to the back. We cut ahead. And this is weird. Lex gets his arm raised because he won the Buckhouse Stampede, and now he's going to cut a promo. So he grabs the mic... And he speaks into the camera, but we do not have footage from that camera, nor do we have audio from his mic. We are stuck on the hard cam, listening to the ambient sound as he cuts this promo over the house mic. Yeah. This sucked. Well, you know. I He said he wanted an unsanctioned tag match on New Year's Day. So this is Christmas Day. So that means one week from tonight on New Year's yeah. Day, I wanted an unsanctioned tag match. Yep. He has a discussion with Oli. They shake hands. Ole threatens Dylan. He says, Tully and Arn are tag champs. I will team with Lex Luger. And Jim Crockett appeared, and Ole said, We will give the people new champions on New Year's Day. 
And Crockett accepted. The place went wild. And they probably all ran to buy tickets right away. Cool. Midnight Express versus the Superpowers for the U.S. Tag Team titles. They had a house show match, but it was over like crazy because it was a championship match with big stars that people cared about. So Nikita had a fucking great lockup. Boy, could that guy lock up. So tag matches were great for Dusty because he could tag in and he could tag out early, not get tired, do a couple explosive things, get out of there. And then they would get heat on him, and all he had to do was lie there and sell, yeah, which he was very good at. And then he could give Nikita the explosive hot tag. So he's laying, he's laying, he's laying, and then Dusty Rhodes throws a drop kick. Yeah. Makes a tag to Nikita. Nikita runs wild, they cut him off. Let me stop you right there. Nikita runs wild, not with punches or clotheslines or elbows. Nikita runs wild with flexes. Sure. He gets the hot tag, and he hits the ring and goes, <sighs> and Bobby Eaton goes, ah! Hey. He's almost to the back. And then like 30 seconds later, not even that, 10 seconds later, they cut him off. They did cut him off very quickly. So let this be a lesson to you. If you were in a fight, don't, don't flex. flex. Yeah. Punchers, kickers. I could somebody. tell you that. Yeah. By the way, this was where the match kind of fell off a cliff. They got well, the heat it, on him for an hour. Yeah. Nothing happened. They worked his no. arm over. They did a bunch of hammer locks. Now, the fans were very much into all this inaction. Sure. <laughs> There's nothing going on, but they loved this nothing. Dusty tags in, hits some elbows, gets the worst figure four this side of Hulk Hogan. At least he got the right leg on top. He got the right leg on top, eventually. No. A four-way breaks out. Cornette hits the ring. The ref sees this and calls for the DQ. Well, Dusty has the dude in the figure four. He's got eaten in the figure four. Cornette tried to hit Dusty with the racket to break it up. Mm -hmm. But Dusty, I don't even know how he got out of the way. But he did, and so the racket smashes to pieces in the middle of the ring. Then the ref turns around, calls for the DQ. There was so much going on, I didn't catch that. Yeah. Now, and there's the important thing. The best part of this entire show. Dusty grabs Cornette and puts him in the weaver lock. Uh-oh. The sleeper hold. Jim Cornette's cross-eyed selling of the sleeper <laughs> is the best thing on the show by leaps and bounds. He's drooling. He's flopping all over the place. His eyes are all over. I think over. I can actually see the Tweety Birds circling yep. around his head <laughs> yep. as he goes out. And then, of course, Cornette's out, because it's not like Cornette's not going to pass out to Dusty Sleeper Hold. And now he must be revived, or he'll die. You know, Cornette on the show on Thursday did mention that he... I was asking him what kind of shows he learned about wrestling from. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He mentioned he watched a lot of Warner Brothers cartoons. Yeah. There you go. He probably got this... Got the sleeper cell from uh, Sylvester the Cat or something. Yep, something yeah. like that. So, so Cornette's out. Bubba revives him. Bubba carries Cornette out of the ring. Somehow Dusty got taken out. I don't even know how. I lost all track of what was going on. The Midnight's double team Nikita for a while. They go to hit a rocket launcher, but as Eaton is in midair, Dusty hits the ring, throws his body on top of Nikita's to protect him. Oh. Takes the bullet for his fallen partner. And... Minutes cleared house. The place is going ballistic for all this. Bananas. Yeah. So it was a nothing little house show tag match with no finish and a wacky, well, bad finish and a wacky post match. And these fans loved it. Absolutely awesome. loved it. Crockett interviews the three horsemen. So Tully quotes the Holy Bible. Really, he did. He said the horsemen thrive They're in the four attention. horsemen, dude. What should they quote? That's actually a fair point. The he, Koran? He ran down. That would, be, that would be, anyway. He ran down Lex Luger for a while. Then Arn cuts a promo. And Arn was the Arn won the promo battle among the horsemen this week. He, well, yeah. yeah. Talks about Lex's athletic prowess, all his unbelievable feats in the gym. He loved working out with Lex and training with Lex. He loved the way heads turned when Lex walked into the room. But Lex put, all, put aside that friendship, friendship with him, friendship with Tully, friendship with Flair, all to make himself a shining star. He used to respect him, but then he threw it all away. Yes. And then Flair comes in. First, before Flair comes in, as Arn is talking, they, they, they zoom the camera back, and Flair is just standing there with this giant grin on his face, <laughs> staring off in his face like, yeah, like he's crazy Flair. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? He's got his sunglasses on, so I figure something must be up. But then as soon as it was his turn, he was on. Oh, yeah. What a promo he cut. I don't know what was up with his hair. 
Maybe it wasn't totally dry out of the shower. It looked like it was wet. Yeah, it was very... It looked, <laughs> Ric Flair with wet hair looked really weird. Well, usually you blow dries. It's very voluptuous. Yeah. Voluptuous, as I say. Sure. But it was wet, so it was all straight. So he had like... Yeah. Honestly, you look at Ricky Morton. He had like bangs. Kinda, yeah. If he had bangs and a mullet, it was bizarre. Like he straightened the back of it. It was maybe, bizarre. Maybe. It says the women are eyeing the horseman, not Lex Luger or Ronnie Garvin. Certainly not Michael Hayes. He called Michael Hayes a poor man's Ric Flair. And nothing happened in poor man's Ric Flair. I've never once thought of Michael Hayes as a poor man's Ric Flair. They have, aside from being pro wrestlers and speaking well, they don't have anything in common. An appreciation for whiskey. That might be on there. Mike Rotunda with, versus David Isley with Kevin Sullivan on oh commentary. Oh, my God. For maybe 30 seconds, this is new heel Mike Rotunda, and it was awesome. And then the appeal wore off, and his work ethic wore off. The fucking fans are chanting boring. 1987, Jim Crockett Promotions Wrestling fans in Raleigh, North Carolina are chanting boring for a wrestling match. Yeah. <laughs> Think about this. That's an achievement. Sullivan's on commentary, just droning on. Trying to sow dissension between Dusty and Nikita. Something about Dr. Death, I don't even know. I spaced out and missed the finish. We had to rewind and check. Rotunda won with a double arm suplex. This fucking sucked. There's three minutes left. Yeah, they say, we have got one more match here tonight, fans. TV time remaining. Okay, and I'm thinking the ball bearing will come out and kill some geek. No. Or, or I don't know who's left. Vinny, they gave they gave you their all. Well, what they got was three minutes of a bunkhouse stampede. A bunkhouse stampede. A dozen guys in the ring and street clothes having one miserably bad brawl. You know what a bunkhouse stampede is, everybody? It is a battle royal where everybody wears whatever they want. Mm -hmm. It is goddamn atrocious pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. Battle royals are shitty enough. Like, this was so shitty and so fantastically boring. The guys are just standing around. You can see them talking to each other, calling spots. Like, nobody's working hard at all. It's just utter shit for three minutes. Paul Ellering manhandling Tully Blanchard. Or, yeah! Uh, Bobby Eaton. Ricky Morton and Tully Blanchard just brawling on the floor. Then I realized, one of the fucking gladiators in this, is in this match. Yeah, there were some stars, a bunch of geeks. And then Mike Rotunda gets eliminated... And the show ends. And there was no finish to this battle royal. No. I didn't like the show very much. <laughs> show it was had... not the best one I've ever that, seen. It was not know. the best week for the show is what Think, I know. Things are going to get rough here after I a while. enjoyed Sting's match. They I passed enjoyed the peak. Cornet selling. Uh, I have little else to recommend. I'm sad because I'm not sure what show it was, but in the Observer for this week, Dave mentions on one of the shows, there is a... A squash match in an interview with Dick Murdoch, which he said was just one of the best things of the year. Yeah. It was not on this show, goddammit. No. Instead, we got that fucking Mike Rotundo, David Isley match. That was, that was terrible. That's why I'm yawning. What can you do? Well, uh, we're going to be back on Tuesday. Apparently, Nitro is back. Is that right? I think this week they're both on, and it's the next week there's no Raw. 